IB Nation, what's going on? What's happening? Irish Breakdown Podcast here, bringing you a Friday free-for-all mailbag. Of course, I'm Ryan Roberts, Director of Recruiting here at irishbreakdown.com, joined by my good friend and publisher here at irishbreakdown.com, Mr. Brian Driscoll. It's been a couple of days, Brian. We uh, yes. we had to take a, take the day off yesterday, and it's yeah. been a crazy, hectic, weird week. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that, they, that we can kind of phrase this week but we are always excited to get back to these fridays especially this free-for-all mailbag is is one of our favorite things because we really push the community aspect so much of of the building of irish breakdown right and this show is for you all right you can kind of you can point the conversations in the way that you want you can start the topics and it it just really is my favorite show of the week and i can't wait to dive into it but brian i think the first thing that we need to get to though because I know you had a little bit of an update on the offensive line coaching hire that needs to happen here at Notre Dame, and I think the first where to start, the first place to start here is obviously yesterday, and even into a little bit into this morning. I know a lot of people have been talking about obviously the, the surfacing of Matt Luke is something that we obviously reported on that he had visited Notre Dame, and it looked like things were obviously trending in a very good direction. Mm-hmm. But what can you tell us, I guess, to start this podcast off of just? you know, the Matt Luke situation and kind of the, the courting, I guess, is the way we yeah. qualify it. It was the middle of the day yesterday, Ryan. It was hearing some a lot of really good things about how it was going. He was very interested, loved Coach Freeman, was absolutely blown away by the direction that they're going and that he r- was really, really intrigued by the job. There was a lot of good feeling that he might take it. But at the end of the day, his family was going to be the ultimate decision maker. And they sat down as a family and you got to understand he's got two boys. One's a teenager. One's about to be a teenager. They're both in you know, high school, going to go to middle school. Uh, they're entrenched and a lot like Mike Elson did several times in his career. Uh, he decided to stay where he is because it was best for his family. Can't fault him for that. I actually have a ton of respect for that, to be completely honest with you. But uh, I can I can say there's people, oh, he just used Notre Dame for this, Notre Dame for that. He wasn't really interested. Why waste time? He was definitely interested. Notre Dame made a great pitch. Money was not an issue. And at the end of the day, just they sat down as a family and decided that he wanted to stay where he is and stay retired and, and continue to be a part of his boys' lives as they grow up. So he will not be, uh, as of right now, I mean, unless he has a change of heart, uh, which I, I don't see happening, he is not going to be the offensive line coach in Notre Dame moving forward. So Matt Luke is definitely a guy that the staff made a hard push for, and I would say probably top of the board guy. I think it's safe to say that, but he decided he wanted to to stay retired for now. And, and, and I know it's frustrating for Notre Dame fans, but I think the key thing there is, Brian, that this wasn't anything Notre Dame did wrong, right? right. I mean, in this particular in, instance, correct. Right, correct. right. Yeah, I mean, we, we can we can gripe about, you know, what has happened previously this offseason, but in there this was no situation. There issue. There was nope. no, couldn't pay him yep. enough, nothing like that. Yep, no money issues, no, you know, lack of communication, like nothing. It was just simply Matt Luke's family was a part of the massive decision, like you said, and they thought it was best for him to stay retired, stay where they are, not be uprooted, obviously, to go from, you know, their home in Mississippi all the way up to South Bend, Indiana. So, you know, it's unfortunate that it ended this way just because, you know, Matt Luke is a really good offensive line coach, and it would have been yeah. something that we would have obviously been pumped up about. But at the end of the day, you can't fault him and his family for not sure. wanting to be uprooted with where they are in their situation. I, 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 th- I want to yeah. say this real quick. I think this is yeah. why Notre Dame fans need to stop obsessing over a candidate. And, and this is yeah. the problem is, is this is why we don't like putting out our choice. Like there was a question in there, who is your number one guy? And I'm not going to tell you that because the reality is, is unless that guy gets hired, I'm not going to tell you that because what tends to happen is, is Notre Dame is looking at guys that can get the job done at a high level. They've got to hire a guy. There's not one guy. That, that's just not how it works. Now, they've got now the task for Marcus Freeman to transition into your next question, Ryan, is going to be they've got to make sure they get that kind of guy, whether he is an established guy or an up and comer guy or a guy that maybe is at a smaller school that, you know, if he gets this kind of look, will do great. 
all those things. Because remember, a lot of Notre Dame fans weren't happy when Harry Heastan got hired in 2012. Oh, he got fired from Tennessee. They didn't even want him, blah, blah, blah. Look, they just need a guy that can get the job done. And that's the reality. I don't care how many people say no. Remember how many people turned USC down before they went, they felt they settled on Pete Carroll, right? <laughs> the key is getting a, a guy that can get the job done at a high level. It doesn't, it doesn't feel good when your top candidates say no. But the reality is, is Marcus Freeman's got to establish himself as a successful head coach, and Notre Dame's got to show that they could put a good offense on the board. That's the reality of it. And in, until that happens, you know, you, you run the risk of these type of things continuing to happen. For so sure. Hope, hopefully they can go, you know, they can get the job done and, and get somebody that's good and then put a great offense on the field next year. And then next time this comes around, we'll be in a little bit of a different situation. And obviously you have been on top of, you know, all the handling behind the scenes of this, you know, coaching search that has happened, which is why you should be signed up at boards at irishbreakdown.com because Brian also had a nice intel piece this morning about there seems to be a couple names that have surfaced to the top of the coaching search for Notre Dame. So, Brian, who are a couple of those guys that maybe Notre Dame fans should get their eyes on if they're not a part of the premium message board? I think two guys to keep an eye on right now are Joe Rudolph at Virginia Tech. He was at Wisconsin from 2015 to 2021. He was the offensive coordinator and O-line coach at, at uh, Wisconsin. He's currently the run game coordinator and offensive line coach at Virginia Tech. And then the other guy is A.J. Blazik. I think is how you pronounce his name. It might be Blazik. He's the offensive line coach at Vanderbilt right now. He was at North Dakota State before that. Obviously won a national championship there was also someone who played for Kirk Ferentz, has coached under Kirk, for, Kirk, Kirk Ferentz, who is, I mean, if you're if you're going to look at the the college football right now, the, the two legends of the game that are currently in college football are Kirk Ferentz and Harry Heastan. Harry's now out. Kirk Ferentz say, is still that guy. And then you look at, at uh, you know, Kirk Ferentz is still considered – a, a great offensive line mind. And especially when, when, uh, when AJ was com- coach, AJ was coming up. And then he also was hired by Kyle flood to be his offensive line coach at Rutgers, which says something to me because Kyle floods, another one of those top five offensive line coaches in college football. So there's some things to like there. I don't know a ton about them. I've reached out to some of my sources that, that are familiar with them. I've heard great things so far, but I just got to learn more about them, but he won't be a sexy name. Ryan, the reality is you hire a guy from Vanderbilt, people aren't going to be fired up about it. But from what I have heard so far, I really like what I've heard from about him. Will he want the job? I don't know. Will they offer him the job? I don't know. It's just a, a name that is considered very high up on the board for Notre Dame right now at this point in time. Yeah. And, I mean, a couple interesting names. I think obviously we'll sure have a lot of conversation piece about, you know, if, if it is indeed Joe Rudolph and A.J. Vlasic moving forward that are kind of the – front runners for the position, I guess, you know, we'll have obviously a deep conversation about how each of those guys fit. And I know we can have a little bit of that conversation today. If somebody wanted to talk about it on the podcast or in the mailbag section, but you know, I'm just going to kind of trust the process here, right? Like I'm not going to jump the gun. I'm not going to be that person that just kind of jumps to conclusions. I, 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 cause I didn't honestly, when you talked to me a little bit about AJ Vlasic earlier, Brian, I didn't know anything about him. I know anything about him, but you look at his resume, you're like, Okay, there's some there's some sure. nice stuff there, man. I mean, he's been around a lot of around a lot of good offensive line coaches. Vanderbilt took a huge step forward this year from an offensive line perspective, comparative to where they were before he showed up on campus. North Dakota State really intrigues me a lot with the power of football that they play. I well, mean, and, and I will say this: obviously, North Dakota State has a lot of success, but their best rushing yards and best rushing yards per carry season was his first year, his only full year there. His second year there was the COVID year, and they played in the spring. Played like half yeah. a season in the spring, so I don't even look at that. So yeah, but we'll, we'll see. J- Joe Rudolph's obviously a bigger name. Um, somebody said Chris Ash hired Blazik at Rutgers. No, he didn't. Kyle Flood did. He was on Kyle Flood's last team there, and then Chris Ash kept him. So I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that that I'm correct on that. So uh, Blazik was at Rutgers from. 2016 to 2018. I'm, I'm pretty sure Kyle Flood's last year at Rutgers was 2016. I'm going to just look at that real quick. Yeah, Kyle, his – oh, no, he is actually correct. Uh, he's actually correct. So that was actually – Chris Ash hired him. So, yes, that would be correct. I thought there was a one-year carryover with Kyle Flood, but I got that wrong. So, yeah, but still, obviously take that one little notch off the belt, but the other part of it is still there. So, yes. Yeah. And, and I would say I have already been listening to a lot of there's some coaching clinics out there on both Rudolph and Velazic. There's a lot of interviews that obviously those 
those individuals have done in the past. Velazic especially is someone that really comes off as a very intelligent guy to me. Yeah. Joe Rudolph does too. So, I mean, we'll, we'll see. We'll see, obviously, how everything figures R- Rudolph's out. Rudolph's an interesting one because he had that one great year at Pitt. After two mediocre years, he was the O-line coach for Joe, for Paul Christa Pitt. And, and they had some years with good numbers at Wisconsin, but they weren't the numbers they used to put up. Yards per carry weren't as high. You know, they had some really good years at Jonathan Taylor, but again, yards per carry were way lower than they were before. And, you know, obviously he, he got – forced out after 2021 but as i told a friend the other day him getting forced out had more to do with him being the offensive coordinator than it did with him as the offensive line coach yes and and so they weren't just he wasn't just going to get demoted to offensive line coach after being the offensive coordinator just doesn't really work that way so i'm not a huge joe rudolph fan to be completely honest with you ryan and i've never i've never been blown away by his alt wisconsin lines compared to the previous wisconsin lines under bostad and other guys. So I'm just being honest. I'm, uh, that that hire would not excite me, to be completely honest with you. But here's the deal. Both of these guys are still significant upgrades over what they had the year before Harry Heastan came back. And, th- yes. and we can't lose sight of that, right? That, that's- well, and, and uh, I mean, for Joe Rudolph, Joe Rudolph's recruiting background is very nice. I mean, just to add like a little more context to him, right? I mean, we'll have to dig in obviously deeper if if he does become the leading candidate at some point as far as, you know, the development of how guys improved over his duration as a coach. But, I mean, if you look at just kind of some of the recruits that he's pulled, while he, especially while he was at Wisconsin and even at Pitt, Pittsburgh a little bit, he does have some nice wins on his belt. So I think he would recruit at a pretty – good level at Notre Dame for some if you can't recruit offensive linemen in Notre Dame you don't deserve to have a job I'm not well, honestly that's true. people that's talk true. about I don't care about recruiting I, I don't that that takes care of itself put a good product on the field I care about what a guy coaches and to your point they did sign a lot of highly ranked guys and yet they still couldn't produce those guys into the NFL at the level the previous coach did that's my issue right and they still weren't as good even though like you said they have recruited some highly ranked guys Logan Brown what did Logan Brown ever do at Wisconsin right he, I mean, he ended up transferring I think right. after this so, year so uh, yeah that's that's kind of that's kind of my thing so but look O-line people like them I'm not I'm just not in love with Joe Rudolph yeah still a big I, upgrade I, over Joe Jeff Quinn big upgrade I, over Jeff Quinn I need to do a lot more research on him, obviously. I did reach out to one buddy who's more in the know from a coaching change perspective, all that good stuff. He had a lot of good things to say about Joe Rudolph. So, I mean, again, I, I don't know enough because, see, about that's where we have to. Yeah. That's where we have to do our homework. Okay, was the yeah. issue with Wisconsin during his tenure there more about him being the offensive coordinator? Could be. Or were the issues with him as an offensive line coach? I think that's a fair thing that we have to ask and that I have to be open-minded to. Uh, I, I know because I'm not a Joe Rudolph fan. I've, I've said this many times. So you got to figure out, okay, was he better just as an O-line coach as opposed to a coordinator? Will not being a coordinator uh, make him a better offensive line coach? I don't know the answers to that. So that's going to be part of of the process of evaluating him. And, and um, he's a Midwestern guy. He's a Pennsylvania guy. He played in the NFL for a, for a couple seasons. You know, played at Wisconsin. Has been at Wisconsin, and you know, was it with at Pitt? You know, with with Paul Christ. So we'll, yeah, we'll we'll just have to see how that, it plays out. That is an interesting layer, I would say, because I, I think the reason that you see so few offensive line coaches as OCs is because. I mean, that's a really like you know. coaching offensive line is a very like you know like an in depth a lot of time type of duration stuff, right? Like you got to spend a lot of time with those guys. You're working with five players at once to kind of create that cohesive environment. You're, I mean, how many offensive linemen does Notre Dame have in their roster right now? What's it, like 18 like 16, scholarship 16 or 16? to 18, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're dealing with a big room, obviously you're coaching and there's so many nuances to coaching offensive linemen from run game technique to pass game technique to just little nuances of being able to be a cohesive unit. That is a lot on someone's shoulders. So maybe taking that step back would get him back to where his reputation did spawn from, but you know, it's just more context that we'll have to consider obviously as we dive deeper into it. Let's get into some questions here, uh, Ryan, and and we'll start off with, with John a one, obviously he's going to kick us off with some questions here and uh, we'll kind of continue about uh, a little bit of O-line talk and get into some other things here. Man, Joe was uh, Joe. John was putting in some work before yes. the show started. Man, you could always you could always um, bet on John A. One giving us kicked off for a show. So he says, if Notre Dame goes in a different direction with the offensive line coach, will Chris Watt be a desired candidate at other schools? Would Notre Dame want him to stay in his current position? 
I mean, Notre Dame definitely wants to keep Chris Watt. Now, whether that's as off, as an offensive GA, whether he's no longer eligible for GA status and has to become an analyst, I'm not quite sure what his status is. I, I, I won't be surprised if next year there's a different GA and Chris is in a different role. It wouldn't surprise me if that's the, the case either. But Notre Dame certainly wants to keep Chris Watt around. There's no question about that. Will he be desired by other coaching staffs? I, that I don't know. That I don't have an answer to. But I, I'd want him to stay personally yeah you would think that he would be attractive obviously just with his experience with coach Eastan. like you would think that he would be desired but again that is speculation but that's one position where coaches really want someone with experience look and and i've heard a lot of good things about how the notre dame coaches feel about chris watt but it's just one of those things where you're trying to build a team that can go out and compete for a championship right now do you want to take a risk of an offensive coordinator who's never done that job full-time a receivers coach who's been a coach for now going into his third season and an offensive line coach that that is as young as Chris is and experienced as Chris is, I think that's a concern. But there's a lot of people that I know around the program that think the world of Chris Watt and his ability. It's just the timing wasn't right, which is, again, why I wish Coach Eastan would have stayed for another year. And we did have a question uh, with the, the, that I think is relevant to, to this one, Ryan, that I'll just quickly bring up and address. And this is from Salty Virginia Peanuts. He says, with Parker being the OC and Luke declining the O-line coach, is there any chance Coach Eastan would return? I just don't see that happening. I, I don't I don't see a scenario in which that happens. I wish he would have not left. Uh, I, I think that, you know, if he came back and, you know, worked with Chris Watt for another year, maybe he could do that. But I just don't see that being an option right now. I, I think Coach Eastan's – I, I don't I, I don't want to speak for coach, but I'd I'd be shocked if he has any interest in coming back. I think I don't think he made this decision uh rashly. I don't think he made an emotional Harry Keyson does not make whole, yeah. uh, emotional decisions like this. I think he thought it through and you know, um, disappointed by it. Wish he would have waited a year, but you know, it, it is what it is. So they're gonna they're gonna move forward and hopefully they can bring in a guy that can can get the job done at a high level. So we shall see. Here's a code question here, Ryan, from Coach Bent 574. And his question is, I know access to practices for the media was an issue last year. Aside from time, how did access differ from the Kelly era once you were in the building? Any areas on SL? Sideline. S- sideline roped off under Kelly. Well, we were never really be able to be on the sidelines under Kelly. We'd have to be like in the bleachers if we were outside or up in the – you know, at the, the Joyce lot or not Joyce, but um, in the Goog, our, the Loftus center, we would have to be like way in the back. There's like this area over top that we'd have to overlook. They didn't let us get down near the field that much. Kelly was varied from year to year. Some years really restrictive, other years not restrictive. My, my, my thought is that Notre Dame, this Notre Dame communications department and those kind of people are going to give us less and less access to, to practices I think that's a big mistake. I could go, I could do a whole show on that. Well, I think it's very short sighted that they do that. I don't think it helps the program. I think they think it does, but it doesn't. And I think their views on the availability of the t- players and the team to the media is very, sh- like I said, very short sighted and very pre NIL. And, and to me, when you go through a 15 practice spring period, and you don't allow media to be around but for a couple practices, where's the buzz? You're not putting out practice reports. You're doing like these little 30-second videos where you can hardly tell who's in it half the time. You know what I mean? Like you you throw out like an occasional mic'd up coach situation. Okay, that's fine. But you're not selling your program. You're not selling your student athletes the way that you need to in this NIL era. And you're also basically – giving a big middle finger to Notre Dame fans who, whether they want to admit it or not, are still the lifeblood of the program. Now, does it help us? Sure. But I'll be honest, Ryan, ours breakdown is better equipped to not have practice access than anyone else because of the unique nature of what we do. That's not an insult on anybody else. It's just a unique nature of what we do. It, but it's still bad. It's still yeah. not good for the program, in my opinion. It's not good for the players. It's not good for fans. There's no pauses from it. And if there are certain things they don't want to report it, then just tell us what you don't want to report it. Don't let us take video, right? Just you take video. Let us just take still shots and then say, hey, you're going to put a video out every day. But to not have more access to this. And like from what I'm told, like talking to Lou Samoji and Tim Priester back in the day, Lou Holtz, everything was open back then. And, and you know, I, I think it I think it's very short sighted and and um, 
I could say a lot of other adjectives about it, but it doesn't help the program at all. They think it does, but it doesn't. It doesn't at all. I just say, look, put guidelines on it. Hey, don't report this. Don't report injuries. Don't report if a coach cusses a kid out. Don't do this. Don't do that. And that's fine. And then if somebody breaks that rule, take away their credential to be a practice again. That's fine. But they won't do that, unfortunately. So I hope they prove me wrong, but I'd be shocked if we get a ton of spring access. I had a couple of different experiences while at Notre Dame a little bit, Brian. And, and I know this is asking about practices, right? Because to your point, I mean, we were up up in the in the seats, right? We're up in the rafters and you know, just kind of watching it like that. Like that's the access we had. And it was obviously a you know, a segmented part of practice that we're able to watch in general. So not much access in that regard. You know, what's funny though, is that like when they do the pro day stuff though, they let you down on the field. Sure. They let you interview the players right on the field afterwards. It's like, why not more of that stuff, man? You've got so much good material. It, they don't <sighs> need to control that as much. Like, like, look, I'm, I'm all for, you don't need to be walking up to players as they're walking off of practice. There are certain things that I think a coach should be able to say, Hey, look, man, don't report this. And say, well, I can report whatever I want. Okay, fine. Then we won't give you access. Sure. Right? I mean, but like, hey, don't get like I've had. Um, it was a Michael Birch asked me this once. He's like, hey, don't go into great detail about specific pass schemes that we're doing. That's a fair request, you know, because like he knows me, knows my coach, know my, knows my coaching background, and knows that I could get real detailed about the different concepts they're running a team. You know, hey, Notre Dame was really focusing on you know in team day on on you know, do an outside zone out of this personnel, this motion, and this alignment. That's probably not something that you'd want out there, right? As you're getting ready to play a game. Totally respect that. Totally get that. That's totally fair. But to be like, hey, this kid really impressed me today during one-on-ones. This is who won the one. There was great one-on-one battles between Joe Walt and Jordan Patelho today, and here's what happened. Here's who stood out. Here's who did this. Here's who did that. You know, th- this is the tempo of the practice. So-and-so really shined. Because here's the thing we're not going to hear a dang thing about like we're going to get the player interviews and then we get to ask the coaches about specific players. But if we're at practice and let's say we're there and Irish illustrated is there and the rivals people are there and the local media people are there, I'm going to notice something like, man, this kid really stood out to me. And then Tim Priester is going to notice somebody else and write about somebody else. And then Tim O'Malley is going to write about somebody else. And then Pete Sampson is going to write about somebody else. And then, you know, Tyler James is going to write about somebody else. And all of a sudden, there's a lot of kids that got mentioned today. Hey, so-and-so did really well today. Oh, wow. I haven't heard that kid's name before. You know, but then I got a, I get a couple, you know, Sean Styers gets a couple questions after a practice and I got to, hey, burn one of your two questions on asking about some third stringer that we're, we're not sure about. You know what I mean? Otherwise, or I could be there and observe it myself and write about it. So exactly. the fact that they don't think that's positive exposure and helps the program blows my mind. And, and you know, look, there's things they should be doing. They should put a video out after every single practice. Every single practice. Because they're and so well done, man. They, they are, are really well done when, when they done. do stuff. It's excellent. Yes. But it's like a 30-second video from a post-practice is not enough, in my opinion. It should be at least, at least a minute long. You're not giving away any trade secrets by doing that and you're creating exposure and excitement for your team there's so little there's just like it's just dead right now around notre dame yeah and and it's because we're not getting a lot of that from the program and and to a degree i understand it they had to move back the offensive coach the offensive interviews i get that i respect that because what are the, what is every offensive kid going to be what's sam hartman going to be asked about if he if we'd had him available last week or the week before Tommy Reese, the OC, all this, uh, he yeah. doesn't need that. He's because he's not going to know the answer, and he's going to get asked about it a billion times when spring practice comes around. Right. So that's but just at least now he knows who the quarterbacks coach is going to be. He knows who the OC is going to be, and it'll be a different deal. So yes. I actually have no problem with th- that kind of thing. But to not allow us to have access to practice to me doesn't help anybody at all. It doesn't even help them, no. in my opinion, because you're losing buzz. And what would Georgia doesn't allow people to practice. Okay, cool. When you win back-to-back national championships, then we can talk about whether or not you want to do what Georgia does. Okay, but you're not Georgia. You're a different okay. animal. Your fans are across the country, right? And you're losing opportunities for your kids to be getting discussed and talked about. What a great day from so-and-so. You know, and then it creates buzz. And then fans go talk about it. Oh, I can't wait to see so-and-so this year. So-and-so is going to be great. And you miss those opportunities when you 
limit access and I and I well, fully expect them to continue limit. And I, again, I hope they prove me wrong, but I just don't see it. It, it limits exposure from a, just a program perspective, but also from a player perspective, man. Like I want to get to know these kids, you know, like yeah. I want to see a little bit of their personality. I exactly. want to know more about that player. And that, that helps not only your program, but it also helps them. Like you can't, like you can't say that you're player driven. If you don't give the players an opportunity to showcase what they can do and who they are to help their brand. I will say this. They allowed the players under coach Freeman and Katie, as opposed to, to coach Kelly in the previous SIDs, they allow players to be themselves more. You don't see as many of the canned answers now as you got in the past. Like they let Audric Estime be himself. He's a different cat. You know what I mean? Like, uh, so, so they don't, they don't make, they don't make them kind of have the same, you know, say what we want you to say thing as they used to. That's a good thing. But we get those kids like, well, we'll get maybe a third of the kids once during spring ball. Right. Right. To your point. Whereas if I'm at practice, I can write about <laughs> Audric Ener- estimate plays with so much fire. This kid's showing so much leadership. This kid's doing this kid's doing that. And, and, you know, T- Priester can write about a different guy and O'Malley can write about a guy. You're at practice. You can write about a different guy. Sean Styers can write about a different guy. And all of a sudden, a lot of these kids are getting talked about as opposed to them dictating who is or is not going to get talked about. Right. Exactly. And that's, you know, and, and then we get to see these kids personalities, but they're not going to be able to tell us well, how practice go. And and, and so I got to ask Audric about Jadarian Price. Hey, how's J- I hate like I hate that. I hate when players get asked about other players. But in fairness, when we don't get to go to practice, how else are we supposed I, to know about how Jabron Payne's doing or how, you know, the freshmen are doing or how. So you know, it, it, tur- it turns into a know. necessary evil at that point. Right. It's like you have to do it or else you're not going to get the answer to the question. I mean, that's just where it is. So. Yeah. So let's move on to some more questions here, Ryan. Let's, let's get through some of these. Here's one from Michael. Co- so, so John A1, Coach Bent, and Michael Collins, like lit it up at the very beginning flooded of the show. It. So yeah, they, they flooded so we love it. it. We love it. Appreciate that. So let's go to this one from Michael Collins. Yeah, and his question is, can players that are moved from football to academic scholarship then walk on to a team? Is there a limit to how many players they can move to academic scholarship? There's no limit. It's it's so f- to answer your first part, no. If you get moved to an academic scholarship, you can't play football anymore. So you 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 can't do that. That would be a that would be very much frowned upon. It's more of a not a number, it's a period in that first year of a coach's tenure, you can move kids off scholarship on academic scholarships. It's because they have a new coaching staff. Not they can't keep doing it for pep perpetuity a year after year, from my understanding. So it's not so much a, a number, it's just about there's not a limit as far as I know. It's just kids have to agree to it. And if they don't agree to it, then then they have to transfer. If they still want to keep playing football, they have to tr- then transfer. Um, but uh, it's a it's a unique window that Notre Dame is currently in that'll end be ending very at the end of the semester, I believe. So that is uh yeah, that that's where they're at for that one. Now, as far as um um, some of these guys, we'll, we'll start learning a lot about some who some of these guys are in the spring because obviously certain guys won't be on the roster. So we'll we'll, we'll see how because they they're still I think at least over ninety I think still right now like ninety ninety one over so ninety that's why I think they're around ninety ninety one still so they're gonna have to they're gonna have to <laughs> get down here here pretty soon. All right, uh, calm down says uh, happy Friday. What is everyone giving up for Lent? Uh, I don't I don't. Partic- participate in that i've never been a lint guy so um i used to I, when i, I was younger I, yeah. I i don't i don't uh i don't practice that anymore though yeah but yeah i've, I've never I, done that i've never been part of a denomination that does the lint thing so yeah. it's just well i uh i, I guess yeah. i mean it's not it has nothing to do with lint but i tried giving up carbs kind of recently and i'm back on it a little bit but that's just more for good health than anything religious based yeah yeah. All right, let's get down to some more questions here. We've got one here from Irish Blooded. Not saying I am advocating at advocating for it. Sorry, I can't speak. But for offensive line coach, what would you think of Steve Adazio, especially with his time at Boston College? Brian, Brian can I just say, please? Do, I actually, you know. I actually don't think Steve Adazio is a bad offensive line coach, but he is just. It's not. It's just not a thing anymore. He's just he not just, necessarily a good guy. Yes, for one, that, right? And I, I, I think the whole coaching thing has kind of passed him by a little bit. Yeah, it's just I think Steve Adazio is still a very good offensive line coach. Yes, I just wouldn't want to sub, sub like 
like, and this is someone who's a Harry Heastan supporter. I would not want to subject the players to his personality. How about that? Yeah, is that a good, good way, way of putting it? It's a good way to put okay. it. Yeah. And, and this is someone who who uh, advocated for Harry Heastan. So I'm just not a I'm not a big Steve Adazio fan, to be honest with you. So, but does he know offensive line? Yeah. Can he coach offensive sure. line? Yeah, he can. He he wouldn't have gotten so many opportunities if he didn't know ball in some capacity, yeah. right? Like he was a very good offensive line coach. To your point. Yep. Absolutely. Next question. Let's go back up to John A1. Here's another one from uh, John. Going back, why was the red shirt so important for Steve Angeli in 2022? Did the staff believe he could compete for the job in 2023, given the quarterback play when there were opportunities he didn't get reps? Well, he didn't play four games, right? No. So the I prop, think he played the like problem. two, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Here was the problem up until the USC game. You couldn't play him more than two games because you needed him for you. You needed him to be eligible for USC in the bowl game should someone get hurt. Because at the time, you didn't know if Tyler Buckner was going to be available. So you literally had Drew Pine and Steve Angeli. That was it. So I think it was more of a situation of just protecting him as, as, as much as it was wanting to protect the red shirt. It's protecting him because you were down to two quarterbacks. Ron Paulus, the third, is not an option to quarterback. Okay. Just n- no. You didn't have Avery Davis, so you didn't have your emergency quarterback either. So you were literally down to two quarterbacks. So I think it was as much about just protecting Steve, period, as it was protecting the red shirt. Now, as far as why why was the red shirt so important, it's not about 2023. It's more about 24, 25, and 26, you know, making sure he's eligible for those seasons. So 22 is his fresh, freshman year, then red shirt freshman at 23, red shirt sophomore 25, red shirt junior 26, or 20, uh, excuse me, 24 would be red shirt sophomore. Uh, 25 is red shirt junior, and then 26 would be red shirt senior. So you know he's not an option for 23. So you want to preserve that season. So maybe if the light goes on in 24, 25, 26, he's got eligibility remaining for those years. So I think that would be the redshirt reason for that. Uh, and I think those two things factored into that. But it wasn't just about the redshirt. It was about you need to protect him because if he goes down, you're really screwed. And it was a yeah. tough line to it was a tough line to be in because you did lose Tyler Buckner. You were already kind of thin at quarterback. And you decided not to go transfer portal. I actually wanted him to go to the transfer portal last year. It just was more for a backup guy, not a starter. The problem is it's going to be hard to get a backup a guy to come in knowing he's just going to be a backup. And then still keeping – Drew Pine, right around. So those are the, those were the challenges, in my opinion, for for kind of keeping that one keeping that one going. That so. that that Avery Davis mentioned, man, it, it got really weird there at the end when you're trying to think like because I remember when after Drew Pine transferred, we we had heard that you know Tyler was practicing, but you didn't know what his full availability but would be for the bowl game i remember we were talking about like does mitchell evans get some reps now does this like who's the next emergency quarterback man it was a it was a wild time there at the end of the season to say the least no doubt about that let's go to some more here's an interesting one ryan from john a1 go ahead and ask this one real quick cake and ice cream versus sandwich cookies and milk versus a candy bar oh so we got like a three-way battle yeah. going on here yeah battle I sandwich cookies, milk. Wait, okay, sandwich cookies versus milk candy bar. Man, I mean, Brian, can, can we start with the 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 elephant in the room here? Is what candy bar would you pick? I think that we need to establish this first before we yeah. really dive into. There's this. probably no candy bar that I would take over like an ice cream sandwich. That, that's just probably not. And the first, it, I'd probably go with the first one to be honest with you, if it's a good cake. I mean, yeah. like I took my wife out to dinner for her birthday and they got us a it was a birthday cake and a piece of some some uh some I thought it was ice cream but it was whipped cream. That's not a mm-hmm. mistake you want to make. Like, you know, you think you're getting ice cream and, and you get whipped cream, it's like, okay. This was not ideal. But it was a really good cake. Really rich, nice nice. I mean, so you give me that and a ice cream like you get like a, a I think who's it Fridays has like a really good like brownie a hot oh. brownie with ice cream on. I think it's Friday's I, has that. That's really good. The, I, I remember when I was younger, when we used to go to Chili's, when I was in like my teenage years, we used to get this molten chocolate cake that had a scoop of vanilla ice cream on top. That was dope. Like that was fantastic. Yeah. I don't really go the, I don't really do the a la mode thing anymore though is the only thing. I mean, sure. 
that would still probably be number one. I would probably go sandwich. Like I'm thinking Oreos and I'm dunking in the milk, right? I mean, that's a fantastic combination. So that'd probably be number two for me. And then candy bar would probably be three. I mean, I'm not really like a true candy bar guy though. I like Reese. Like I just want some Reese cups, you know, like just give me some Reese cups and I'm good to go there. So, so John, I think you actually have it in the order for me. I, I think yeah. you have it in the order. That would be my order. Yeah, it would be my order. No question. Let's go to another one. And, and uh, we always say, talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. So we've got one here from Sean Green. Are there certain players on offense and defense you want to see have a role to let you know that the coordinators are not just playing what's most comfortable, but playing the schemes that work best? Well, I don't think it's a scheme thing. I'm more like my conversation's more, are they willing to make the tough decisions to play maybe yeah. better talents over the veteran? Like that's kind of like, my question. I don't see it. anyone on offense where I'm like, that guy's not playing. So they're, I, you know who I would say on offense, actually, I'm going to scratch that. Here's who I would say on offense, Chris Tyree. If Chris Tyree is not a focal point of the offense, then they're just playing what they're comfortable with, not necessarily playing their best guys. Because again, we can, we could agree. We could all agree for the sake of argument, that Chris Tyree is not one of the two best running backs. I think that's debatable depending on the system you're going to run. If they're going to go to more of an inside outside zone offense, I think Chris Tyree is, is can be dynamic. But let's just work with the fact that he's more of a change of pace than he is an every down back, just for the sake of argument. You're still screwing up as a coach if you're not getting him the ball minimum five times a game. Every time last year that they got him involved in the offense and he was a focal point of the offense, he played very well and the offense worked every single time. Every time when they would just try to pound him down up the middle, run duo all day, and he didn't do anything and the offense didn't work. But go watch how they used him against Cal, against Cal, and well, especially like late second second quarter into the second half when the offense started rolling. Go look how they used him against North Carolina. Go how they used him against Clemson. Look how they used him against South Carolina. And against South Carolina, because they were willing to use him, even there were things where he wasn't making plays, but how South Carolina was defending Chris Tyree when he was in the game opened up a long touchdown or opened up a long run by Tyler Buckner, opened up uh, the big play to Braden Lindsay because they came down so hard against his motion, things like that. So uh, that's what he brings to the table uh, that, that there's really no other back that we've seen on the roster can do. Now, maybe Jadarian Price can be that guy eventually, but he's not there yet because I mean, we haven't seen him play a snap of college football outside of a, a spring game. So if, if there was going to be a guy on offense, it'd be Chris Tyree. There's nobody else on the offense that I'm like, if they're not playing that guy scheme wise, it's not a great idea. Defensively, I'd say the same thing. I don't know if there's anyone defensively that I'm like, gee, the scheme is such that they're just not using this guy. So I, I think they all can kind of play different things. I don't I don't think that yeah. would be something that I would say. I don't think it's a scheme thing for me either. Like it, it's like I said before, it is a are you willing to take a chance on a younger, inexperienced player? Because the veteran is not getting it done. Like if the linebacker position stays the same as it was last year, Brian, and they are just like not willing to play Jalen Sneed and Nolan Ziegler and that crew, then that's a bad sign for me, right? Like that's yeah. your that means that you are just you're just complacent with being what you were last year. And last year wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. So if it's not working, you have to try to find answers. Right. Agree. Let's go down here. We got something from Shaquille Oatmeal. Thank you, Shaquille, for this for this super chat. Thank yes, you very sir. much. Thank you so much for the super chat. Seems Marcus Freeman is looking for four coaches, quarterback coach, offensive line, NOC, and or uh and or head coaching experience. Is that with OC or head coaching experience? Oh, I'm sorry. With OC and let me restart this one then. Seems Marcus Freeman is looking for coaches, quarterback coach, offensive line. With offensive coordinator and or head coaching experience. There we go. Is that coincidence or intentional in order to help Parker out from Alberto? I, Alberto, I don't think it's meant to help Parker. I think it's meant to just help the, the staff in general. I think it's meant to, you know, he, he's clearly looking for experience. He's clearly looking for guys that, that, uh, that have been through the battles and the struggles and the wars and those type of things. And I think that's a big part of it, right? It is, He's a young coach. I think he recognizes his inexperience and says, hey, if there's if there's way and this is what a good leader does. Hey, I know what my strengths are and I know what my strengths aren't. And every coach has weaknesses, every single one, Saban, Urban, Dabo, all of them. You've got to the, the, the best coaches say, hey, I'm going to find a guy that 
maybe has some strengths that I don't. And sometimes it can be personality. Sometimes it can be experience. Sometimes it can be, hey, I want to spend more time with the offense, so I need to hire a guy that's, that, that can do certain things in the defense. There's all types of areas that it goes. If you're a smart offensive coordinator, say, look, I know pass scheme. I know this. I know the X's and O's, but I can't teach run blocking. So I need to hire a guy that's great at teaching run blocking. That That's being a smart coach. And get the best guy you can and not be afraid of someone who may have ideas that challenge you. And I think that's what the best coaches do. And so uh, is, it, is it partly to kind of add more experience to the staff being led by Parker? Sure. But I don't think it's, gee, I don't think Jared can do the job. Let me go out there and hire a bunch of guys that have done it before to help him along. If he was that concerned about Jared Parker, I don't think he would have hired him to be the OC with some of the other candidates on the board who had been head coaches. I mean, there are head co- there was OCs on the board that I that I can say relatively confidently won the job who had head coaching experience. It's just they decided to go in a different direction. So I, I think if he was that dead set on having it, he would have got one of those guys. I think it's just he values experience, period. And I think that's something he was looking for in the staff this year. It's my, and it's I- my two cents. And I think usually guys that have a longer track record, more experience. I mean, there's a the law of averages are that they probably have been in a couple different positions at some point in their career. So I, I think it is coincidental in that sense, but it does spurn off of the fact that you know you, you do have criteria that you're trying to fill. Fill. You're trying to find an offensive line coach that is an experienced guy that can pick up the pieces and you know kind of where Coach Eastan left it. You're tr- you've, we're trying to find an offensive coordinator and a quarterback coach that have that experience as well. So I think that those are just kind of coincidental when you really look at it. All right, let's go to the next question. We've got another one up here from John a one. It's been said that even great coaches make bad hires, but with that said, are there any common circumstances that lead to those mistakes? Here's a few that I've seen, Ryan. Number one is you hire someone who's got a great track record as a recruiter and not as a coach. That's the mistake to, uh, co- um, Urban may, or uh, Coach Saban made with Tosh Lupo. I'm not quite sure how to say his last name. He made him his defensive coordinator. Tosh had built his reputation on being a great recruiter, decent D-line coach. He made him coordinator because he wanted to – that's how he had to get him over there. I think that was a mistake. Another one that I see from college coaches is they go too hard into the NFL route, right, which is another mistake I think Coach Saban made. Uh, sometimes I think coaches – hire guys that lack the leadership to really take charge of an offense. That's a mistake that urban made when he, when he promoted Tim Beck and Ed Warner to be offensive coordinator. Sometimes you recruit a guy, you put, you promote a guy who basically is just not dynamic enough. I think that was also the issue with, with Tim Beck and, and uh, Ed Warner. I think in other instances, Ryan, you, you hire guys that are great position coaches and think that they can be coordinators and they're just not. That was what happened with Kerry Coombs at Ohio state or Ryan day. I felt that about Jimmy Lake. I think Jimmy Lake was a much better just corners coach than he was a secondary coach than he was a D coordinator, and he was definitely better at both of those than he was as a head coach. Uh, he was a disaster of a head coach. So I think those are some of the things that you can do. And then another one too is, is you know, you hire people that you're close to can be another one. Now, not all hires of people that are close to you are bad hires. I mean, what were the best hires that that Marcus Freeman made last year, in my opinion, right? I mean – Harry was a great hire, not someone he knew. The other two, I would argue, the other two best hires of guys that weren't already here, because obviously Mickens would have been a hire, but you look at you know, Chris O'Leary and Jared Parker were both excellent last year as position coaches, right, or a position coach and special teams coordinator. They were both friends of his, guys he's worked with before. If Brian Kelly hadn't already hired Mike Mickens, I guarantee you Marcus Freeman would have. Also a friend, somebody he's known for a very, very long time, did a great job. So I, I think the 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 mistake with bad hires when you hire a friend of yours is 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 not so much that you make the hire, it's that you won't you're not it's harder to fire him. Yes. And I and I think that that like I don't I don't fault Kelly for hiring Brian Van Gorder. I didn't like the hire, but I didn't fault him for it. I didn't think he was going to be a disaster that he was. But you should have known after a year this ain't going to work. It took Urban Meyer one season to realize that Tim Beck and Ed Warner weren't going to get the job done. Right. And, and, and then he moved on. So I, I think those are things that you have to, you have to look at Ryan and say, you, you just have to be willing to move all away from those, but the circumstances for why coaches make bad hires varies. And here's another legitimate reason why coaches make bad hires it is sometimes it's just guys are great coaches somewhere else. And they're just not a fit where you are. 
personality wise, scheme wise, don't connect with the players. There's all types of reasons why. Sometimes that's a factor too. Guy was a great coach somewhere else and he just doesn't fit with what we're trying to do. And then yeah. you also have to know a coach's career goals. Matt, Matt uh, LaFleur did a pretty good job coaching quarterbacks, was basically useless as a recruiter. Why? Because he didn't have any intention of being here more than a year. He was he wanted to go to the NFL. You got to know those things too and be prepared for it. And you can even sometimes still make those hires, but you got to know that and not ask that guy to recruit the freaking state of California, which is one of your most important states. And and that's what they had him doing. So those are those are the type of things too. It's just not knowing where a guy's ambitions are and not being prepared to handle the things he may not do as well because he is contemplating moving on. I think those are things are all, all factors in it, in my opinion. Which shows that there's a lot of things that could lead to it. I think the biggest thing you hit on, though, and I think that we even saw it this past cycle, is that you need to know when to hit the eject button, man. Like You need to be very self-aware that, like, I did make a bad hire. I give Mario Cristobal – I mean, Mario Cristobal had a bad first year at Miami from an on-field perspective. But one thing he did was he was like, man, that didn't work, right? Like, right. eject. Get this out of here. Will the next wave work? We'll see, right? It, that is a to-be-announced, to-be-determined type of thing. But he knew instantly that Josh Gaddis and it just wasn't the thing. Like, and we also be said last offseason that the Kevin Steele, Charlie Strong thing was not going to work. They were going to bring in some yeah. good recruits, and then eventually he was going to move on to someone who can coach. We called that, and he was willing to do it Yep, and and did it quickly and got a pretty good recruiting class out of it that first year. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's the thing. You look at Urban Meyer firing Everett Withers after a 24-2 and two run. You know, I mean, th- those are things that coaches do. Uh firing a guy after a season you know look Dabo went with Brandon Streeter for one year realized it wasn't the right move that wasn't his role moved on from it that's what you have to be willing to do and it's even harder when it's someone that you like or that's a good person and so that can make it a challenge and that's the toughest job that any coach does if you if you can't be willing to make the tough decisions when they need to be made you're gonna have a hard time reaching your full potential in my opinion and brandon streeter was obviously a Dabo guy you know and right. one year as an offensive coordinator and i mean i i give Dabo a lot of credit i mean i don't want anybody being fired but at the end of the day Dabo was like that wasn't good enough man like there needs to be something different like that's not the right fit in this situation even though i know you even though i love you even though we've had a, a past relationship like you just need to be self-aware that way and i think yeah. the best coaches are self-aware because I mean, to John's point, and we've talked about it a ton. Has there ever been a head coach that has not made a bad hire? Everyone's made a bad hire yeah. at one at one spot or another. It Bill Belichick's the, the greatest coach of this generation, and he freaking hired Matt Patricia to be his offensive coordinator this year. Yes. And Joe Judge. I'm like, and that Joe was a Judge. terrible, terrible hires. Terrible but hires. A- after the after one year, though, Bill's like, you know, that was a bad idea. Yes. Let's move exactly. on here. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. So it's a good question there. Uh, it's a good question. So you got a two part from Coach Bent, Ryan. His question is if you could take one position coach from each side of the ball from the Weiss era to now and put them on a current staff, who would they be? Let's say current coach left from f- for promotion to open up possibilities. Okay. I, I appreciate him putting that caveat because I was very uncomfortable with the question at the very beginning because, again, it's going to be like, well, I'd fire this guy. And, yeah. So if it was up to me, coach from the Weiss era, boy, that's a tough – because Weiss didn't hire make a lot of good coaching hires, to be completely I, honest with you. I might uh, have to look up some rosters in yeah, the past here real I, quick. I would <laughs> probably say Tony Alford if Dylan McCullough left would be a good one because Coach Weiss hired Tony Alford in 2009. You know, some of the defensive hires, boy, I mean, I, I wasn't in love with a, a lot of his hires. I would say, you know what, if Chris O'Leary – well, see, I shouldn't say this one because I think he has since passed away. Uh, so that wouldn't that wouldn't make a lot of sense either because the one that I was had thought about, Ryan, was, was Bill Lewis, who uh, I thought was a good football coach. Um, no, he actually – he didn't pass away. Who am I thinking of? The, oh, Bobby Elliott passed away. That's who passed away. Coach Elliott passed away. Um, but Bill Lewis would, would have been one, and and uh, he he would have definitely been a guy to look at. I thought he's a very good safeties coach. So if Chris O'Leary got promoted to go somewhere, that'd probably be my my pick there. I didn't like a lot of Coach Weiss's hires to become. I mean, Rob Ionello was terrible. 
I thought I think Bernie Parmalee was did a pretty nice job uh, during his tenure at times. I, I wasn't a huge Mike Haywood fan. I, I didn't. John Latina was just kind of mediocre. Uh, then he hired was... Frank Verducci, and he was not good. Rick Minner was not a very good defensive line coach. Jappy Oliver wasn't bad. Uh, Peter Voss as a quarterbacks coach was a good hire, but that was oh, you know who it'd be? Here's who it'd be. My quarterbacks coach, if Gino Gadouli didn't want to come, it's David Cutcliffe, because that was Charlie's first quarterbacks oh, coach. That's hire. a good one. That's so a I'm going to cheat a little bit and take yeah. David Cutcliffe. If I can't get to, to David Cutcliffe and Tony Alford would be my guys. But defensively, Ryan, I, I don't – I mean, Jappy Oliver maybe on the D-line would be about the only ones that I could think of other than Bill Lewis. But Bill Lewis is 81 years old, so I don't know if that one would make a lot of well, sense. But hey, if I get hey, in his prime Bill Lewis coaching safeties, I could live with that. Hey, Haywood was the one that coached Miami, Ohio, right? As the head Correct. coach there for he got a little fired bit. Fired after yeah. like he he went there and then he went to Pitt and got fired after like a year at Pitt, I believe. Yeah. So, yeah, not my favorite person. Corin Brown, just no. That was that one was a disaster. Ron Paulus is quarterbacks coach. No, not good <laughs> at all. He just he just John Tenuta. I just uh, yeah. I mean, Bill Lewis or Jappy would be the two on defense. I thought Jappy did a solid job as a D line coach. He wasn't a great recruiter, but he was a solid D line coach. Bill Lewis would be my pick for defense if I had to. If he was a little bit a little bit younger now, but he was really good. Do you remember Bill Lewis, safeties coach? Not, he was not, a, not Georgia as much. Tech for a while. He was a really good football coach. He was just he was an older guy. You know, he was a head coach at Georgia Tech for three years in the 90s. He was with the Dolphins before brought, Charlie brought him on for a number of years. He was a really good coach. Really good coach. David Cutcliffe's the easy answer, though, right? If he, Yeah. Uh, well, Tony Alford, is, Tony Alford would be my number one, oh. but David Cutcliffe would be my number two, in my opinion. Just because Tony Alford's just still a little bit more in his prime, where Coach Cutcliffe is kind of like, you know. That's why I'd love to see him get hired as an analyst. I think that would be a, a great – yeah, so here we go. I'd bring Tony Alford in as a position coach. And I'd bring David Cutcliffe in as an analyst. Then I don't have to get rid of Gino or have Could Gino you, go somewhere else. David David Cutcliffe as an analyst is like, that is as much home run as you'll ever find, man. That is insane, honestly. Yeah. That would be insane. Yeah, I'd, I'd be a big fan of that action. There's no doubt about that. Let's go to ND Estimate Trucking LLC. Question, Ryan and Brian, who do you feel has the most upside and will be able to get on the field the fastest out of the 2023 defensive line class? Well, upside, we talked about this the other day. For me, it's Bubakar Traore. For Ryan, it's it's Armo Mukum, but we have them yeah. one and two. And Brendan Vernon, a close third for me. Uh, it, it, they're all three really high upside. The guy that I think could get on the field the fastest, there's really two for me. And one is Devin Houston. He'd be my number one. And then Brendan Vernon would be my no other one because he's just so dang strong. Yeah. Like I could see him finding a role and just say, hey, dude, just go kick that dude's butt across me. I know you don't have great hand technique. I know you don't have to do this yet, but I just want you to, you know, pretend like that guy said something about your mother and go do what you got to do. Because <laughs> Brennan's got a little bit of a mean streak in him. Like he comes across as this like really quiet, apathetic, just kind of like nonchalant kid. Right. Just doesn't care. doesn't care about anything. He just wants to go hunting and fishing and hang out with his friends. He doesn't get into the recruiting game. He didn't care about where he's ranked. He didn't care about what anybody was saying about him. He just wants to play ball and then go fish and hunt. But when you strap him the helmet on, he's a different kid, right? Yes. He's a very different kid and, uh, and a talented kid. He's just really raw. So, but he's, he's to me probably the least raw relative to, uh, size and all those type of things. Him and Armel would be my next two. And then Bubakar probably be fourth as far as like getting on the field the fastest, Ryan. What what are your Bre thoughts on that one? Brennan Vernon's my number one, actually, because mm -hmm. I think what you said, Brian, he'll he'll be able to match physicality early on in his career. Like Brennan's going to come in with that demeanor and the physicality that like he doesn't I don't think Brennan Vernon is going to care from day one who's across from him, what that guy's resume is how many accolades he's had, if he's an All-American. I think day one, he's going to come in and be like, oh, Joe Walt, cool, I'm going to I'm gonna whip your butt. Like, that's just kind of my, that's kind of my thought process there. Devin Houston's an interesting one because he is more physically along from a technical perspective than the group overall. But I, I just, I go back to Brendan Vernon. I don't know why it is. I don't know what it is. I mean, we quantified it with a couple different things, the physicality and the strength and everything. But he just seems like one of those guys, man, that like he's going to catch a coach's eye because – Yes, there's refinement that needs to happen, but he's going to play with his hair on fire, snap in, snap out, and play physically. Like You can guarantee that that's going to be in Brendan Vernon's vocabulary the minute that he comes to campus, is that he's going to work hard, he's going to play with a hot motor, and he's going to play physically. And 
I mean, even if it's just a roll maybe on the goal line or something like that, just like locking stuff down, I mean, it's possible. It's possible. Got one from Matt, 2011 GT. What is the driving factor as to why the media access is limited? I don't know specifically why I have some thoughts as to why I think it's the case. One thought is, number one, Notre Dame likes to control the content. And that includes meaning no content, right? They want to drive the narrative, even if the narrative is nothing, uh, number one. Number two, you know, they're trying to move to this fighting Irish media thing, which I understand, but it's like, but you're not doing anything. You're not putting stuff out there. You guys are missing so many opportunities to get content out there. That that you know that you could put out and 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 people would be very attracted to. They're not doing it. I think that there's there's just not a lot of respect for what we do. If I'm just going to be completely honest with you, from from a lot of people that I've met, and I'm not the only person that believes that. I think I'm probably just the only one that I know of willing to say it. You know, that's the difference. But uh, they haven't been the most media friendly group uh, in in a little while. Uh, and it, it it's just it's you know I don't know if that was Kelly if that's Swarbrick if that's you know different people I don't know who that would be uh, I think that's part of it as well and then I think from a coaching standpoint I don't think coaches necessarily want it because coaches if I'm a coach I don't want the media practice I don't because I want to be able to say whatever I want not have to worry about how it's going to get reported or whatever the case may be and, and I get that I, I'm sympathetic to that but that's what I'm saying is like if there's certain things you don't want out there then say, hey look don't don't tell people what the coaches are saying. You know, oh, Harry Heastan really got on this guy. If you're going to say something, be very vague. Coach Heastan spent extra time today working with so-and-so. Or if we're going to talk about coaches that are still there, you know, Coach Coach McCullough was really in tuned with what so-and-so was doing. Now, you and I at practice knew that he was just ripping this kid left and right, right? But but as a coach, some days I would do that. i say, I'm going to be so hard on this kid today because – I just need more from him and he hasn't been locked in and I just need to make sure that he knows that I'm here. And, you know, and so this guy is just going to hate my guts today because everything he does is going to, I'm on him in warm ups. buckle your chin strap, tuck your shirt in. What do you, you know what I mean? Get ready to get locked in, stop talking, get, and, and it just sets the tone from that day on. I'm going to be on you about everything because you haven't been locked in the last three days and I need to get you straight. Well, I wouldn't want that being reported because it's going to come across without context, man, Coach Driscoll just did nothing but rip this kid the entire practice. He must have something against the guy. I'm sympathetic to that. I really am, because we don't know the context of why this kid was getting his butt chewed out all practice. You know, it looked like he was going hard to me, but you don't know what happened yesterday's practice that we didn't have access to. You didn't know what happened in the workout this morning uh, that he missed or he was an hour late to or a half hour. We, we don't know that context. So I'm sympathetic to that type of thing. I'm sympathetic to, hey, guys, don't put specific schemes out there. Don't say today we worked on inside dog blitzes or something like that. Today they worked on installing cloud coverage or, okay, I get that, right? Focus on the results of the plays and evaluating the specifics of the players. I'd be fine with that. And I would respect that. And if you don't respect that as a media person, then you lose access because I do think they should be able to do that where we've set certain rules and it's not rules of like, you can't criticize someone. Well, that's BS, right? I mean, that's, that's BS, but Hey guys, don't talk about injuries. That's a very fair thing because their thought is, we need to make sure, A, that we know what the injury is, and B, that his parents are informed before Notre Dame fans on Twitter. Yes. Very fair. Totally get that. Totally respect that. Don't talk about specifics in this regard, right? Like one year they asked us not to say who was the first team and not. I was like, okay, that doesn't make any sense. It's the third day camp. Nobody cares who the first team is as far as like your opponents, right? But whatever, we'll, we'll not do that. So you can put guidelines on it as long as they're clear and they they stay consistent. And if people and then have the violators of those be removed, right? So like, don't take pictures of these kids. Don't do this. Don't do that. Okay, fine. If we break those rules, but like one year they had it to where they didn't want us to report an injury, and so some guy for a Chicago paper reported an injury, and so they removed all of us and wouldn't let any of us come back. I'm like, well, that's stupid. For all I know, and I'm just hypothetically. Let's say there's some guy who doesn't want to be at every practice that starts at six in the morning. And he's like, man, this is ridiculous. So I know if I break this rule, they're going to kick all of us out. There's no actual repercussions for me because it's not like they're going to remove my credential because I talked about an injured kid because they don't do that. But 
we're just not going to come. Well, problem solved. I don't have to pe- keep showing up from Chicago every day for, you know, drive an hour and a half to go to practice every other day at six o'clock in the morning. All right. Okay. So, so, so then don't let that person come right. Because they break a rule. So there's a lot of reasons why it could be. I can't tell you specifically what it is. I just, I can tell you what they're missing out on, right? It may not be an ill will behind their decisions or maybe no contempt behind their decisions. They much, they may just be thinking, Hey, this is what we want to do, or this is what the coaches want or whatever. Uh, but they're missing golden opportunities. And to me, part of the communications and SIDs jobs is if a coach doesn't want more access to make the case to him, why it's actually good for more access, you know, and just say, Hey, look, what are you concerned about coach? Well, I don't want this, this, and this getting out. Cool. Then we can put those standards onto the, onto the people. We're agreeing with you. We're entering a partnership with you. We agree to, cause they don't owe us access to anything. They, they don't owe us access to practice. That's the one thing that people want to understand. I, I'm not entitled to be at practice. They don't have to let us at anything. I'm simply saying it's best to do that. So if they then want to put conditions on access, I, I, I'm fine with that within, within certain reason. It's like, okay, wh- what are we even here for? But honestly, even if they were like, hey, you can't report anything specific you saw from practice, still let me be there. I'd still do it. I mean, you know me, right? I'd still be there. But the point is, is they could put conditions on it. The coach doesn't want this reported, this reported, this reported. This reported. All right, cool. And if somebody violates that, I know you all read what we write anyway, right? So don't pretend like you don't. If somebody violates that, then don't let that person come back for the spring. But, you know, that, that would be my thing. So it could be a lot of different things. It could be a combination of things. But I just think it's a mistake, especially in the NIL era. It is... Like it is a huge mistake not to do. You should, as an institution, be doing everything you can through as media as many media outlet channels as possible to be promoting your kids and your coaches. Because people just, see it. People yes. See it. Yeah. Yes. Well, and, and like future recruits see that stuff too, yes. and they're like, "Oh, that's cool, man. That's yes." Dope. Like there should be a mic'd up day every after every practice. They should put out two videos after every single spring practice. One is like a minute, minute half long highlight video, right? And you don't have to show anything. You're not, people aren't seeing players. You're not showing all 22 versions of highlights. And they should have a mic'd up with a different coach every practice. Every practice. Now you get to edit what people see, right? So the time you MF some kid because the kid did something deserved MFing, you don't put that in there, right? Okay, fine. But those are great things because kids get to see you in your element, like the stuff with Dylan McCullough over the other day. That was pretty cool. Was, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, let people see that that's good for recruiting. It's good for promoting him and what he does and his future aspirations. You should do that w- with a player a couple times in fall camp. Hey, we mic'd up Sam Hartman today. Dude, that would go over like gangbusters. Put that on YouTube. Man, that thing would get they would make bank off that thing. You know what I mean? Like and that's the thing is like they're just they don't do a lot to promote those things, those revenue streams that they should could be making money off of. They don't do enough to promote that, in my opinion. Well, that comes that comes back to the personality side of stuff. Like I would love to see Sam Hartman right. mic'd up. I mean, just right. as a general, not even from a it's not even from just a general fan. Like, I mean, because like NFL draft stuff, right? Like next year, people are gonna be searching on YouTube of like Oh, Sam Hartman stuff. And then, oh, here's a mic'd up thing on Sam right. Hartman. I'm going to listen to it to see how he leads and stuff. Like, that's and, and like Notre, like Notre Dame trying to do this fire, fighting our Schmitty thing. Like, if they ask my opinion, and trust me, they don't care about my opinion. But if they ask, I say, you guys should have like these really cool productions. Like, you should have 10 to 12 in fall camp, a day in the life of videos where you follow a coach around or a player around. And, and just do different things where today, you know, here, here's – remember what they did the day that Coach Freeman was introduced as head coach? And they had that thing where he kind of got up in the morning and then he did this, he did that. And that something like that in fall camp, put that on YouTube or put that on your Fighting Irish Media TV. And, hey, you, in order to get access to this, you've got to have it. But then make it to where we can embed it in our stories because you still then get clicks for that and still get the views for that. But just say, hey, if you're going to do this, you got to embed it from our thing or whatever on YouTube, which is totally fine. Like they actually do that. Now, if you're going to put the whole press conference on there, you have to use our YouTube thing. You have to embed our YouTube thing. Totally fine with that. Totally, totally makes sense. And, and so those are those opportunities too, where that's not benefiting us per se. I mean, we could put it up into a story, but I'm not going to make much off of that, but it is promoting your program more. 
Yeah. And so it's not just about, well, of course you feel that way. You want more access for more content. Of, of course I do. But that doesn't mean that what I'm also saying about how this is actually beneficial for your program isn't also true. And there's things that I would have them do that don't have anything to do with us. So we wouldn't have access to or be able to make money off of just which is but it would be good for the program. And that's where I say, boy, they're missing so many opportunities with that kind of stuff, you know, and, and you know, maybe only do four or five in fall camp or something like that. Those are all the different aspects that I, that I look at, you know, and say, hey, um, like, here's one. So they, they do a thing where they follow Chancey Stucky around one day. And Chancey's always got like these really fly shirts and hoodies and stuff, right? And then we have a guy on our board whose who's handle is Chancey Stucky's hoodie. And that's yeah. his board name, <laughs> yeah. right? And, and so then you, the next day you say, hey, we're now selling, you know, like you give Coach Freeman his thing. And we're now selling the, the hoodie that Coach Freeman had at practice yesterday. People would buy that. You'd make yeah, money would. off that, right? And so those are all opportunities that you're missing out on to, to not only promote your players and your program to the outside world, which is important, but you're also missing out on chances to make money. And, and, and the fact that they have this disconnect where we don't owe the fans anything really is what blows my mind. Because that's who ultimately you're hurting when you limit our access and limit what you're doing. That's the thing that it hurts. It there hurts. was... There was a picture recently. I forget if it was a coaching visit before the dead period or what it was, but there was one where Marcus Freeman was wearing this dope hoodie, man. It was like this white, really nice hoodie. And I, I, I literally thought to myself, like, if that was available, I would buy that right now. Like I would buy it right without even thinking about it. Just that stuff. I think that's interactive and it's cool. And yeah, I mean, I think you need to capitalize on that type of stuff. So agree completely on that. Yeah. So those are things that I wish that they would do more of. And I just, I don't, and I I know some of that's, I mean, that's not cheap. You have to pay people to do that and pay for the equipment and all that. But number one, it would eventually pay for itself if you're really committed to it. And number two, again, you're Notre Dame. This is not a problem for you. And you could even make it to where you tied in with different parts of your campus, right? So you have kids that are majors in such and such, and this is what they want to do. You have a TV and film degree, I'm sure there are kids in there who want to get into production and stuff like that. Then have them be the ones doing it. And it's a great opportunity for them too. Now you're helping them. They're the ones putting yeah. this out. And they've got that on their resume as opposed to going hiring and paying, you know, $80,000 to hire a, per, hire a person to come and do it. You hire someone to oversee it and to help them, but have them do it. That'd be so great. And 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 I know they do that to a degree already, but like really take it to the next level. These Look at what these kids would have on their resume. You know, so like, there's so many things that they could do. Like if, if I, if I was in that job, I'd be like, dude, we need to lean into this. Like, no, no, we're going the opposite direction, right? We need to lean into this. And right. some of it, we allow the media to do some of it we're going to do and, and really promote and sell our program. Cause you've got to find that niche right now. You've got to find that NIL niche. You don't want to promote this. You don't want to promote that. Then you can at least promote your players to the people that will then pay them. And the fact that they don't do that better is, is really frustrating to me. That that would be so cool if some of those kids coming out of school had just like a Dropbox link, drop Dropbox link where they could just throw out there that's like, look at all these cool videos right. that I was a part of the production of that. Right. That is so cool, so cool. Yep, absolutely. I, I just I think all that stuff would be great, and it would create a lot of buzz in the program, and it would just be it would be like remember the year they did the the Showtime thing, like that was big, like there was a lot of buzz about Notre Dame that year. Now I don't necessarily want to do that again, right? Like. But I'm not going to lie. Like, it was pretty cool that one day one of the coaches was driving in and they're listening to our podcast. I was like, okay, that's pretty awesome. I'm hearing myself on Showtime. That was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we had to sign waivers for that, by the way. We had to sign Did waivers you? so they could use our – yeah, they could use whatever we wanted to – whatever they wanted from our shows and stuff. So that was pretty wild. That's awesome. Yeah, a buddy of mine called me. I, did, I didn't watch it. I wasn't watching it on Showtime. A buddy of mine uh, called me. He's like, hey, I just heard you on <laughs> – on, the, on the, a season with Notre Dame. So I started watching a couple of them after that. All right, let's get back to John A1 with a question here. Based on pure based on pure talent, how does the 2023 Notre Dame defensive roster stack up against the other really good defenses of the modern era, 2012, 2017, 2018, 2020, 2021? That's a good one. It, it, I'll say this. Number one right away defensive line to me is not as good as 2012 uh, or 2020 in my opinion 2020 20, 2021 
I'm not sure of. 2018, definitely not. 2017, uh, eh, you know, it, potentially it's not there yet, but it could potentially be better than that group. Linebacker wise, not nearly as good as some of the groups they've had in the past. Definitely not the 2012 and 2018 group. No, no, especially because 2012 was more about Manti. Although I thought Danny Spond was a very underrated player on that team that year at Rover. And, and, you know, you had Dan Fox, who's just kind of, eh, you know, Carlo Calabri, who's just kind of, eh. but Manti was great. Danny Spond, very underrated. You could technically call Prince Shembon a linebacker, but he was a he was a defensive end. He, you know, yeah, he used to run that know. three four back then. Yeah, he like, was a defensive yeah. end. Uh, twenty eighteen had a great linebacker duo inside with with Tavon Coney and, and uh, Drew Tranquil. Twenty twenty, you know, look, the linebacking core should be better than the twenty twenty group, but it isn't as of right now because Shane Simon was just not good in twenty eight. And Andrew he White was really bad. Yeah. Drew White was solid in twenty twenty. Good I player. Thought. Yeah, solid player. And then you had Jeremiah at Rover. But you won't have anybody as good as Jeremiah, but you could be better across the board than that than that trio. Where they stack up really well against all those groups except 2018, as I think they're better in the secondary than all those teams except 2018. They've got to, the safeties have to show me something this year before I'm ready to say they're better than a 2018 group. Because Alohi and Jalen were really good in 2018. Yeah. Now this secondary has a lot more depth, especially at corner than that team had. But like even Tariq Bracey stepped up late in the year. If you remember, uh, Troy Pride got hurt, didn't play against Pitt. Dante Vaughn started. Dante was banged up already, and he struggled. They put Tariq in in the second half. Tariq just locked down the Pitt receivers. And then like they came out in the Florida State game that year, and Florida State kept thrown deep on Tariq, and he they went like 0 for 7 throwing at Tariq in that game with DeAndre Francois quarterback. So to me, like that secondary was really good. It just didn't have a lot of depth. This secondary has to show me at safety. It can be as good as anywhere close to that safety group. But uh, the safety, the defensive backs, in my opinion, are better than they were in 2012. Not by a ton because that 2012 group was pretty solid. But, uh, you know, you, you to me, they were definitely better than 2017. They were better than 2020 for sure. And I think they're better in 2021 by a pretty decent margin, to be honest. Look, t- last year's secondary was pretty good. He had to play here, play there, but it was pretty good. Yeah. And especially down the stretch and late in the season, they were really good, in my opinion. It just, you know, they, they didn't get a lot of love. And a lot of people are still, you know, blaming Cam Hart for what he did in the opener. And he had a couple of dumb plays against North Carolina. And then they just kind of let that define his whole season when in reality, Cam Hart had a lot of good film last year, right? A lot of good film. And that's why you didn't hear from him in the second half of the season. When you don't hear from a cornerback for like half a season, which is basically it's what happened thing. after Carolina, that means he's doing something. And yeah. that's pretty much what – there's a reason that teams kept throwing at Benjamin Morrison. There's a reason for it, even after all the interceptions, because the option was what? Throw at Cam Hart? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, nope, not going to do that. So I actually like the secondary, Ryan. The, the defensive line has potential, but it's a big question mark, and the linebacker – position is another big question mark for me what are your thoughts on that yeah I mean I I secondary was the first one that came to mind I mean I was just starting to reminisce about I mean 2012 2020 was what was that that was Nick McLeod and Clarence Lewis right was the corners in that group obviously you're I mean substantially better there right I was thinking about the 2012 I remember Zeke Mata was one of the safeties was Jamara Slaughter, was he one of the other safeties in 2012? He got hurt, though, yes. He got hurt, yeah. So he got hurt against, uh, I think, uh, Michigan. It was like around there. And then yeah. Matthias Farley replaced him in the starting lineup. And it was yeah. him and Zeke Mata. Zeke Mata, yeah. Yep. And then Elijah yeah. Shoemate was the third safety in that rotation. He played. He was kind of their nickel guy that year at times as well. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and I just remember that that was just a rock-solid group. But, I mean, I really do think that this – the 2023 defense, man, like I think there's a bad rap going around a little bit. I mean, yeah, there's there's a lot of question marks. There's some wild cards that need to kind of come to the forefront. But I think the defense has a chance to be good. I mean, I because so I think when you look at that, I mean, that defensive back crew, right, the, the corners that you have are – it's going to be one of the best corner groups in all of college football. If you get some good play out of a gr- safety group of Xavier Watts and – Maybe if Clarence Lewis moves back there and Ramon Henderson and DJ Brown, like if you're just good at safety, that secondary is going to be one of the best in college football this year. Defensive line wise, I think there's a lot of untapped talent, man. Like I, 
I don't think people talk enough about the fact that, like, yeah, Jordan Patelho didn't play a ton last year, but he still had the second most sacks on the team, man. Like, he still had right. it with, like, four and a half sacks. Like, that kid's a really talented pass rusher if he is a consistent player that you can count on. If you can count on him, I think he's going to give you a lot of production. We've talked about Joshua Burnham a ton. I think that he has a chance to be a good football player. Riley Mills is a wild card, but if Riley Mills takes a step up, that unit comes from a, a little bit of a question mark to potentially very good in 2023. I think that he has that type of unlocking potential. You need to figure out the depth of the nose tackle position, but I think the point blank for me is that the defensive line does have a lot of upside. There's a lot of upside up front. Linebacker has upside in the fact that there's a lot of talent, but I don't know what to expect of that unit, man. Like I just don't know what to expect of the linebacker group. Think I think for me, JD Bertrand is a good football player. I expect him to be a good football player. There's a lot of talent outside of that with the Maris Loyfels of the world. It was an obviously talented kid. You have Jalen Sneed. You have Nolan Ziegler. Talent's not the issue at linebacker. I just don't know what to expect. I mean, but I do think that if everything clicks, and again, law of averages say not everything's going to click, that it could be a really good defense. And one of the best defenses they've had in a couple of years, just th- this one is a – this is a up. In, this is a very volatile group. I think that's the best way to. I don't it. think they need to hit the inside straight to have a really good defense. I think another another mistake that I think people are making is we're still working with the assumption that last year's defense was bad. It wasn't. It was still a pretty good defense. It was a top thirty national defense. It was a good defense. It just wasn't good enough. That's the difference. Like this isn't a. They weren't Brian Van Gorder's twenty fourteen or twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen defense last year. They're still a pretty pretty solid defense, right? Top thirty defense. It's just you need to be top 15. You need to be top 10. That's the difference, right? And it's not as good as it was. So I think sometimes people act like, boy, their defense just sucked last year. No, it didn't. They held Ohio State to 22 points. They held, they held Clemson to 14 points. And let's be honest, all 14 of their points came when the game was over, right? I mean, if we're, if we're going to be honest about it, right? I mean, USC scored 38. Part of that was on your offense, if we're going to be real about that too. You didn't play well against USC, though. The defense locked North Carolina down until the game was over, and North Carolina got a bunch of garbage points late. I mean, so the defense played bad in some of the games. You're like, dude, how 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 are you playing bad? How would you give up that many points to UNLV? Right? Like, how many? How would you give up that many points to Navy? In the big games, they played solid football. They did. I mean, you gave up you gave up 30, uh, 38 points in the bowl game. You gave up two pick sixes. That's not on the defense. You know what yeah. I mean? And and they needed to pull out some fake you know, some, some chicanery on special teams to get another touchdown. The defense wasn't great in the, against South Carolina, but it wasn't terrible. And it was really good in the second half. I mean, really good. So I think there's a misconception about how the defense was last year. It was still a good defense. It just wasn't a great defense and it needs to be a great defense. And so I think the defense is going to be solid again. Uh, it, it's at least, and I think we're going to see some improvement from certain position groups just because of the, of the, experience that they're going to have in that system. Maturation. Now that's not a good thing. Yeah. In my opinion, you don't bank on your guys needing to be in a system for two or three years before it starts being better. That's not a good thing, but it will happen. You will see improvement in that regard, but will it be improvement to mean you're just, you go from good to pretty good, or are you going to go from good to title contender? That's the question. And that's going to require some changes from a coaching standpoint, as much as this is going to require players stepping up. But I, I did want to say that, Ryan. I, I just feel like there is a lot of misconceptions of or negativity about the defense that is way overblown, right? Like way overblown. It's be critical, yes. But when people start talking about like Al Golden's the next BBG, give me a break. Notre Dame wins a title in 2015 if they have Al Golden's defense, in my opinion. You know, and and – Say what you want, but I'm pretty sure Al Golden would have known what to do with Manti, with Jalen Smith. Here's if Jalen, if they would have asked Jalen Smith to do what they're asking uh, uh, Maris to do, he's an All American. Uh, I, just Maris can't do that. That's the that's the problem. Jalen was a pretty smart football player, so it just that's I, that's I, my whole thing, Ryan. I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that there's not talent on the defense. I feel I feel like people keep talking about, you know, they need to get this guy and that guy in here. And it's just like, hey guys, you know, Joshua Burnham's pretty talented, man. Like there's right. there's some talented dudes on that defense, you know. I mean, Xavier Watts is a talented kid, you know, that Riley Mills is a very talented right. kid. Like, there's a lot of talent on that defense. Does a lot of it need to take a step forward this year? For yes. sure. 
But that doesn't mean it's bad. That just means it was solid. And but that's it true at Georgia. Could be better. Somebody's got to step up and replace Jalen Carter. That wasn't yeah. Jalen Carter last season, right? I mean, that's part of college football. Who those guys are going to be, I don't know. We'll find out. But somebody needs to do it, in my opinion. We had an interesting one here. I want to read this, Ryan, from Scott Hoyland. I really appreciate Scott saying this. He goes, I worked for Fighting Irish Media when I went to Notre Dame. Notre Dame has the physical resources, cameras, et cetera, to make all these cool videos you have ideas on, but they spend employee time on other projects, such as video board content for home games, projects for other sports, and some content for NBC broadcasts, which, again, I don't think helps the program. And I don't know if it helps the student athletes. I don't know specifically what they're doing, but I really think they're missing out on opportunities in my big, in my opinion. And, and it's good that they do things for other sports programs, but then I expand your student resources to have people that work with basketball to have people work with, you know, other sports, because that that's another area where NIL is a big thing. Now, you know, the women's softball team, who's pretty good. Like I think, did they make the NCAA tournament last year? I think they I think did. They, did. They, were, I think they, they were top did, yeah. 25 team most of the year. Like have some students that are geared towards putting out cool videos from that. They do some decent stuff with them. But like those are things that I do because those girls need to get their names out there more in, in social media aspects and different Be things because, like that. Because of be the NIL can really help them because some of them are paying to go to school. Well, I, I was going to say, though, the NIL thing, I feel like people just think it's just a football thing. It's like all these right. athletes can yes. take advantage of yes. it. They can all take advantage yes. of it. Like Michigan does a really good job of promoting Benjamin Morrison's sister. Have you seen the stuff they put out for her? She's haven't. like a world-class, like a like a big-time NCAA uh, gymnast at Michigan. Oh. And he's always retweeting stuff that Michigan does about her. And so uh, that's just something I think Notre Dame should take a lot of pride in. And again, are you promoting NIL? No, you're not. But you're promoting your student athletes, making them more visible, getting more excitement about them, which then makes them more marketable. So you yeah. are helping them in ways that you should be helping them, in my opinion. And so that's just the things that I wish that they would do a better job of. And again, they're not going to listen to me because they don't care what I have to say. But hopefully somebody that, that can make a difference there can start doing more of this because – Limiting access and and not doing more of this stuff doesn't help your it hurts your program in my opinion. Real quick answer to this question from Jimmy McGill: What's taking so long to announce Gino Gaduli as quarterbacks coach? Guys, this is just how it goes. This is every year people ask the same question last year about Al Golden. They asked the same question last year about Harry Heastan. This is just what Notre Dame does, and and it's 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 fine. They they Notre Dame wants to make sure they never have to do another George O'Leary situation, and there's nothing wrong with that. They know he's going to coach. He's around. It's fine. Just fine. I, I, it, I forgot about the George O'Leary thing. Forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yep. So let's get back up here. We've got something here from Coach Bent five seven four. This question is for recruits that are driving distance to campus, i.e., Drake Bowen. Aside from probably hotel costs, what differs between an if, uh, official visit and unofficial visit? Well, I mean, it's just, it's just the, it, look, official visits, you get paid for everything, right? I mean, I don't know that you mentioned, you know, aside from the travel stuff, also on official visits, there's more of an emphasis on like from the tour perspective, like on an unofficial, your tour and, you, you know, the facilities, the football facilities and everything. Official visits do more of also the, we're going to take you through the dorms. We're going to take you through the academic facilities, that type of stuff. So it's a little more in-depth. It's not just football. It's a little bit more all-encompassing of everything, which is like a that's a big reason outside of obvious that they pay for everything on the official versus the unofficial. Right. They're usually shorter trips as well. That's the other thing. Um so that's another difference between the two. And there's usually no overnight unless it's like the night before you'll stay at a hotel with your family. But again, it's, it's, I think you can pay for like one meal. I, I think on an unofficial, like you can provide some food on an unofficial, but you, it's different than when you're on an official. Right. All right. Let's get to some more questions here. We've got one from Michael Collins. Uh, here we go. His question is for dual sport athletes with what determines which sport their scholarship counts against. I believe it's it used to be Ryan where you had to if you were like on a football scholarship you had if you were going to play football you had to be on football scholarship I think that's changed and the reason they did that is because like Miami was getting these guys on track scholarships like Santa I think Santana Moss was on a track scholarship at Notre Dame but Miami was getting around the eighty five scholarship limit because they were putting these kids on the track team 
and then <laughs> we're spending. So I think it's more about you've got to be able to you've got to spend the time with that. Sports got to be your primary thing. Like, for example, uh, well, actually, I shouldn't use an example because I don't know if he was on scholarship. Like that that's really what it comes down to is it's got to be that. Uh, you've got to spend a lot of your time on it. I don't know the specific rule of football because like Notre Dame had a, a walk on punter last year, Brian Dowd. I, he played on the soccer. He's actually a better soccer player than he is a football player. I don't know if he's on scholarship on the soccer team though. Right. Like that, that I don't, that I don't know. He may be a walk on for both. I'm not sure. Yeah. So I, I couldn't tell you what the specific uh, rule is on that, but like, I know, you know, if you, if, you, if you're on football scholarship, you're going to, you know, football is always going to rule. So I, I'm, I'm honestly, Michael, not hundred percent sure on what the rule is now. It's changed a couple times over the years. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, so it's like, you know, Drake Bowen is going to play baseball at Notre Dame, but he's a football scholarship. Right. Yeah. I mean, Jordan face on, I know he's a preferred walk on, but he's a lacrosse kid. Like that's kind of where his initial, I guess, I guess that kind of determines preference. All right, let's go to this next question here. We have another one from John A1. John says, since 2000, what was your favorite Notre Dame team to watch? I'll start. I'll never forget that 2005 team. I'll I'll, 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 I'll say mine real quick, too, because it's 100% the same as John. That 2005 team, man, like Samarja, Stovall, like that's just ingrained in me. Brady Quinn, like that was the team for me. That was, the And it also came after just such a – bummer of a stretch yes. you know, the Davy that Davy era was miserable like Ty gives you hope in 20, 2002 and then just psh, 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 fall off a cliff and then you're coming off of like the worst recruiting class like ever at Notre Dame and Ty's last year and you're just like people are predicting though like I remember watching was it Kirk Herbstreet or Lee Corso was like they're gonna lose their first six games and it's just like you come out against Pitt and you're like whoa like, and I believe that was a Larry Fitzgerald pit team. And you're like, whoa, this team is not bad. And, well, I, and then, I, re- I remember it was like one of the first couple games, Brian. I was like, who the heck is Jeff Samarja? Like, I had right. no idea who he was. Right. It was just like, whoa, like, he, man. he had a pretty good game in the insight.com. I was in the insight.com bowl the year before against Oregon State. He had a, a pretty good year. But like, you know, then the next week they go on the road and they beat number three Michigan. And even in the loss to Michigan State, it was an exciting game. It was 44 to 41. They ripped up Washington. They ripped up Purdue. And you're like, man, this team can score. And they were so bad offensively before that year. It was just fun to watch, you know. And and that team played with confidence. You know, took USC down to the wire. Uh, the 2015 team for me was really fun to watch offensively. Probably my most fun offense to watch because they were just a home run, home run waiting to happen that year. The problem is, is that defense was so bad. It just takes away from how fun that team was. It really was. So since 2000, I'd say 05 and, and 8 and 15 were the two teams, which means we need to be getting ready for Notre Dame to have a great run in 2025 if yes. we're going to keep with that, you know, that that trend of exciting teams to watch. So let's um, hope, man. Yeah, I know. Well, hopefully they can happen a little sooner. Well, I, hopefully it's like a three year stretch getting yeah. into the 2025 yeah. season. But yes, yes. Another quick one from John A1. Michael Mayer is a big loss. What is the ceiling of the talent in the Notre Dame tight end room in 23, and how does it compare to 2012 to 19 tight end rooms at Notre Dame? I'll let you take first crack at this, Ryan. I, I mean, John, for me, the production is going to be allocated to different spots. You can't you can't expect – well, I mean, one, I don't think anybody's going to expect one guy to, to handle the loss of a Michael Mayer, right, if we're just talking about the production side of things. Still going to be a talented room. I mean, at the end of the day, especially when Eli Raritan comes back as well sometime during the season. Because, I mean, there's a lot of teams in college football, in my opinion, that if you told them you could have a tight end room of Mitchell Evans, Holden Stace, Eli Raritan, Cooper Flanagan coming in, like, that's pretty dang good, man. I mean, it is. It's a really talented room. So it may look similar to some past teams, though, in the sense that – I. I think it might be a little more spread out in spots, you know, like it might be in in that regard. Like I don't expect one tight end to have 700 yards next year. Maybe one guy has 400 yards. Another guy has 200 yards. Maybe you have a third tight end that has a few catches. Like I think that the production is just going to be spread out a little bit more, but from a talent perspective, there's not an issue of talent at the tight end position at Notre Dame. It's just when you had Michael Mayer for three years, Nobody else behind him is going to get the crazy production. There's just more question marks 
to who they're going to be the guy to actually step up, right? Is it going to be Mitchell Evans as a pass receiver? Is it going to be Holden States as a pass receiver? There's just uncertain uh, uncertainty of production after being behind Michael Mayer, but I do not think it's a lack of talent. I think it is still an incredibly talented room that a lot of teams in college football would, would trade for. How's the stack up from 2012 to 2019? Uh, less proven and just as deep. That's what I would say. Uh, in, in, in some instances, deeper. There's a lot of tight ends on the roster with talent. Now, there's some banged up guys, but there's a lot of talent there. I think, Ryan, you nailed it. There's no Michael Mayer. But you know who else doesn't have a Michael Mayer next year? Everyone not that's outside of Athens, Georgia. Yes. I mean, <laughs> that, that's just – that's the reality of it, right? So uh, I think they'll be fine. Yeah. The, the more and more I go back and study Mitchell Evans, I'm like, dude, with another year in the weight room and, and getting more reps, because he missed a ton of reps last offseason that for a kid like him who was converting to tight end, I don't think I appreciated it enough how that could slow him down early. Like he was not very yeah. good when he first came back. I'm like, why is this kid playing? He's he doesn't look 100 percent. But you're like, this kid missed a lot of development time that he needed because he's not a tight end by trade. It, but you saw him get better and better and better. He looked good in the bowl game. I mean, there's a he's couple a more balls. He's that a came talented as well. kid, man. He he's is. And you get kid. him another year in the weight room, and he's going to have a chance to. So I had a chance to meet his dad after the uh, Virginia Tech game in 21. And he comes from good genes. Like his dad's a big fella. So he's going to, and I mean, like, like big fella, like broad shouldered, like big, very nice. I met him and his mom, very nice people. But uh, he's going to fill out, and he looks like I, – I said this before. Him and Joel look like – if you just look at them like from here up, they look like they're 15 years old. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> hilarious. So the point is he's going to fill out. Where Michael Mayer showed up in Notre Dame as a true freshman, looked like a, a third-year NFL pro physically. I mean, he just looked like a grown-up. Mitchell Evans looks like a little kid who happens to be 6'5", 6'6", 250 pounds. <laughs> The point is, is gonna uh, he's gonna hit a growth spurt and and take off in my opinion. So I wouldn't be shocked, and I love Holden Stace as a player. I really like Holden Stace as a player. That two, that duo could be really good. Now Kevin Bauman's more to a number three role, which is where he is, and then you can be patient, let Neil Raritan come back and get healthy, which is important. Yes. He, the most important. I don't care if he doesn't play a snap this year, as long as he comes out of it healthy, that's the key for me. You know, and then you're bringing in Cooper Flanagan, tremendous. who's a good football player. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, Brian, those are Brian, yeah. Brian Mitchell Evans could be like 265 pounds. He's got that type of frame, man. He is a big old boy. He's a big yeah. kid. I mean, he yeah. really is. I I mean, honestly, from on the hoof, I mean, if that kid's going to be six five, six six, two hundred and sixty pounds, be able to move pretty well and be able to block. I mean, that's an NFL profile right there. Like, there's no reason that if he's developed properly, he shouldn't play on the next level. Like, he has that type of physical demeanor yeah. to him, right? So. Yeah, if he's developed properly, there's there's no issue with talent in the tight end room. No issue at okay. all. Okay, I'm not interviewing for any jobs in Notre Dame, nor do I want any jobs in Notre Dame, nor would I take any jobs in Notre Dame. So please stop putting into the chat jobs for me to take in Notre Dame. I would greatly appreciate that. Love the support. Thank you for that. But um, we don't. it's not happening, and nor do I want it to happen. So let's just kind of chill a little bit on that. All right, let's get to some more questions here, Ryan. We've got another one from – let's get down here. Let's mix up some of these a little bit. Let's go with Scott L. Let's get a, uh, one from Scott L. here, Ryan. Do you see any path for Tyler Buckner to beat out Sam Hartman? What would he have to do to overcome Sam Hartman's superior experience or is Buckner's running abilities an equalizer? Look, there's a path for Tyler Buckner to win this job. He's just going to have to play significantly better than than Sam Hartman and be just a consistent, dynamic playmaker. Yeah, and then also be able to do the things, the 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 everyday things. Right? It was just, can you also make the easy reads? Can you make the easy throws? Can you do the simple stuff? And if he can start doing that, and then be a playmaker, turn you know, limit the turnovers, and sure, he could beat out Sam Hartman. I'm not expecting it, but he could. And to, to your to your question, Scott, part of that is his running ability. Because if it just comes down to who's the better passer, Tyler Buckner's not beating out Sam Hartman in 2023. It's not going to happen. But you can't you can't eliminate that, in my opinion, from the conversation because that is part of his game, is the running part. So is there a path? Absolutely, there's a path. It's just going to be hard because Sam Hartman's really good. And that's why I'm hoping that Tyler can embrace it a little bit. And I would still have a role for him. I, I, I'll say the same thing now that I said in 20, 
2021. If you, you've got a Tyler Buckner's too dynamic of a football player, then I'd have some kind of role for him. Yeah. Like you just, you have to have some kind of role for him in my opinion, something. Well, something. I, I think, I think it comes down to dependability. Like that's a big thing. I mean, Sam Hartman back to back years has thrown what 38 and 39 touchdowns, yeah. 39 and 30. I mean, he has been a consistent, you know what he is the last two years for wake forest. You know what he is. Tyler, you don't always know what he is because of injuries that have obviously set him back a little bit. And then there's been a little bit of up and down play when he has played. You know, it, it, it comes down to you have to match the dependability of a Sam Hartman to give yourself a chance. Like you have to, because at the end of the day, that's where then it's like, oh man, both players are playing really dang good football, right? Like they're all a similar wavelength, but like then. That's where Tyler Buckner's running ability is like, oh, that might be the that that is the equalizer. Like that's the separator right. at that point. But it, it's just that Sam Hartman's just such such you, he's such a more known commodity. He's such a more dependable football player right now. You need Tyler to be that type of guy because hey, Tyler was looking really good last preseason going into the game, but it's like after game two, injury happens again, right? And there's just not much dependability in that regard, and that's what Ty, that. You think that that's what Sam Hartman brings to the field this year is that you know what he is. He's a known commodity. You know what to expect. You know what to depend on. I'm sorry I'm laughing at you, Ryan, but our, I love our chat. Our, our our people are so great. Are, Matt, are we talking about – did you Matt, did you see the Matt, thing that they were saying on the board? On. Matt, no. Matt 2011 GT said, dang it, not even Driscoll wants to coach at Notre Dame. <laughs> and then Ted Wozniak said, it's because Notre Dame won't pay his buyout. That's what I heard. <laughs> Oh my goodness gracious, that's really funny. Yeah. Oh, thank you guys for that. I needed that good chuckle. Uh, here, here we go, Ryan. John A1 says, Who is the best Notre Dame player to wear number seven in the modern era, which is since 2000? I mean, Will Fuller was the first one that popped in my head. Yeah, there's there's three that pop in my head immediately Isaiah yeah. Foskey, Will Fuller, and Jimmy Clausen. Will Fuller for me. Will Fuller yeah. for me. Yeah. It's uh, uh yeah, it's uh. Wait a minute. Hold on. Was I always get Will Fuller's number? I always think that he was he was number fifteen at Notre He's fifteen Dame. as a I, right because a of the NFL yeah. right and and because he wore in the NFL too. Uh, but um, Will played on better teams. Jimmy Clausen's se- junior season was unbelievable. Those would be my two best. I I always had a thing. I always still thought if Carlo Holiday would have been able to play in a Lou Holtz offense, he would have been really special. He's another number seven I liked, but those are my three. Carlisle was had, a great athlete, man. Carlisle needed athlete. to be playing in a Tony Rice offense, not not one that they tried to have him do. But he was still been really I, good. I still remember when Brett Favre set the all time leading uh, leader in completions. Carlisle Holiday was one that caught that football, man. Oh, and really? I did, I did yes. not know that. I did not yep. know that when he when he set the completion record. I forget who held it before him. Maybe it was Dan Marino. That sounds kind of right to me, but. When he set the completion record, it was Carlisle Holiday who was on the receiving end of a Brett Favre pass that year. Interesting. Very interesting. All right, Ryan, let's go to the next question here. We have one from uh, Michael Collins. Are analysts required to live in South Bend area or can they work remotely? I'm sure they could work remotely depending on what their tasks are. But I think you'd always want to have a guy around, at least to some degree. But I'm sure if you're going to have someone who's doing advanced scouting, I don't think he necessarily needs to be in the office. The problem is, is you're going to have other people involved with him. But I think with all the technology today, Ryan, of getting film and Zooms and stuff like that and getting, I mean, I can put some together, turn it into a PDF and have it over to you in five seconds. You know what I mean? Like there's ways to do it. If if you can get the right guy and it, it just would depend on what his role is. He can't be part of like the team, you know, like if he's going to be like helping with the offense and preparing for the upcoming game, you need him there. If it's someone who's doing future scouting, that is almost like a, a scout in the NFL, right? Where they, they don't need to like a lot of scouts don't live. Most scouts don't live like where the team is. They live in the regions that they're covering. And they just need to be at the facilities when they have their meetings or yes, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So uh, it could be something like that. It, depending on the role, if you have an analyst whose job is is built around, hey, you're scouting the rest of the country to make sure we have good, we know who, if when the transfer portal opens, we know who can fit. That person doesn't necessarily need to be at Notre Dame per, per se. So I think there's plenty of roles you could find for someone to not have to be there. So 
It's a good question, Michael. Good question. Here's another one from Scott L. Do you? We already answered this one. Oh, we did. That's uh, no, sorry. This is the one from Scott L. I wanted to catch. Gotcha. What could we learn from spring practice that would make us think that the second year under Golden will be much better? Are there changes we can verify or specific things to look for? That's a good question. Uh, I just want to see guys being more sound in what they're doing and more aggressive. I want to see less guys running around doing a million different things and just, hey, be good at something. Find something that they're good at. I want to see a more attacking defense, Ryan. I want to see a team that that shoots gaps a little bit more with their front, doesn't just eat up space with their, their front as much as we saw last year. So just overall aggressiveness is, is something I want to see. And then less assignment mistakes. Yeah, I think we can start seeing that in practice. You, you want to see guys that, that are where they need to be more and more, guys that understand, um, you know, kind of, hey, here's, here's where we're at, and – we know what we're supposed to do and we're in position. We're not giving up the big plays because, because we were out of position. We're not getting ripped up. If the offense is going to do something, they need to earn it. I think those are all verifiable things that we can see this spring that if that's the case, then you feel good about the the defense taking a step this year. I think those are the things that I would look at. Well, and I think that playing faster is obviously a big thing that we talk about. Cause one thing we talked about last year before Ohio state, Brian was that Jim Knowles at his previous stops, the first year, it was kind of like, you know, a lot of learning curves and they really didn't play incredibly well. Then year two, year three was where they really picked it up and became much better unit, obviously. I'm interested to see if there's some lights that go on in the spring in this offseason. Like, is Maris Loyfowl all of a sudden not look like a deer in the headlights at times? Like, are there some safeties that are like, okay, I get this now, and they start just playing faster. That's the biggest thing for me is I want to see what the speed – on the field looks like from these players because there is a look I, I think that there was much there was too much put on a lot of players plates this year we talked about that a ton but there is the other side of it. it's like yes that might be true but it might also click in year two then right like they might retain it and they might be better for it long term at least in the system itself so I think the natural maturation from a just understanding what the, expe the expectations of a player are I think that you'll see if a guy is really starting to get it and something clicks, you start playing faster. You look like you're moving at a different speed comparative to years past. And I, I hope we see that. I really do because there's a lot of speed and a lot of talent on that defense that I just feel like has not been tapped into enough. Let's get to a couple super chats here. One is from Chino Aguirre. Thank you very much, Chino. Says, Chino Good said, job, IB team. I, it's just kind of a comment. Sorry, Ry. Uh, Can we please get some gold in them uniform pants? I want to ask you this question, Ryan. Yeah. Does Notre Dame need to either A, change their pants, or B, go back to the old pants-helmet combo? Because I love the shiny gold helmet, but it just it looks terrible with the pants that they have. The, the mustard pants they have now it looks terrible. <laughs> they definitely need to change the pants. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I, I'm just trying to – man, I mean, yeah. I mean, gold pants would be great. I mean – you definitely need to accent the gold a little bit more than just the helmet, in my opinion. Right? Like, there, there's just not enough gold. I think I agree with Chino in this. Like, there's just not enough gold. So whether it's just gold pants in general, whether it's you know different types of variations of pants where you kind of highlight the pants on, you know, whether it's just kind of stitching or some type of you know kind of outlinings, like something. There needs to be something. There definitely needs to be more gold, man. Don't steer away from it. That's one thing I liked about year one, as far as like the gold throne thing that Notre Dame did, or like with the recruits and stuff. Like accent that gold, man. Steer into it. Don't be afraid of the gold. Here's a question I want to ask everybody. I, I've said this before, and, and I have a feeling I'm, I'm going to be very much in the minority here. Uh oh. <laughs> I would actually like to see Notre Dame do different uniform combinations while staying I would to, to their, I would tra tra their traditional colors. For example, one of the best ways to get gold in your pants, because here's the deal it's almost impossible to match the gold in your helmet to a full solid color pant. Like, Unless you're going to what do it, like you're going to bedazzle them and put like golden like sparkles on them. And that's about the only way you're going to get it to match. But what about a white pant with you know a gold stripe down the side or an interlocking ND? I think that would look really sharp. I think that like to me, if you're if I'm going to design the perfect Notre Dame home uniform, and I don't think people would like this white pants with a gold stripe and a green interlocking ND, the blue jerseys, gold helmet with green 
gloves, and cleats. That's what I would do. I think that'd be friggin' sharp. That's where I would go with it. But I just don't know if the traditionalists will allow Notre Dame to ever have anything but gold pants. That's the would problem. You, would you have any green in the uniform at all outside of the gloves and the, and the spikes? Yeah, the, N, that... the ND would be interlocking. Okay. Like to me, I yeah. don't want the I want the green to be like to pop. You know, where yeah. it's not all over. I would do one green a year. Um, in my opinion, I would do one green like jersey game a year. The you know, like Marcus Freeman did last year. When when it's the Irish go gr- wear green game, you should wear green. Yeah. Right. And so, but I that's why I like the idea of the gloves, the cleats, Ryan, because I think you could get the green to pop there like they did in the uh I like I loved that in the cotton bowl in 2018. I loved it. I never thought of it until they did it in the cotton bowl where the players had uh green gloves and green helm or green cleats. Now it was with their road uniforms. I wouldn't be opposed to going a gold, blue, and blue for a home game a year, for like one home game a year. Like I just I think when it comes to just the now the jerseys, I'm not touching outside of one green a year. I'm not touching the jerseys, but the pants, I think you can mess with. I'm not messing with the helmets. They're pure gold and that's it. I'm not putting logos on them. I'm not doing any of that stuff. It's, even on the Shamrock games, I personally would not mess with the helmet. I'd mess with the jersey and all that, but I'm not like I there's only been one like the Michigan game in 2011 when they put just the Shamrock on it. Do you remember that? I thought yeah. that was sweet. But that's it. That's the only thing I would do. I wouldn't do all that other stuff. But I would like I wouldn't mind messing with the pants. I think they could do some stuff with the pants, the gloves, and the cleats that would be really sharp and still stay true to who you are, right? Because I don't want to do the Oregon thing. We've got like a different color combination of every game. But I think there's some things you could do with the pants that could mix things up a little bit and make Notre and make it look really sharp, in my opinion. I do. So so for the gold, blue, and blue, same question though. For the blue pants, you would still have like the gold striper and the interlocking, like that would be consistent in that look. Say that again. So if you did the gold, blue, and blue for the pants, you would still have the gold stripe and the interlocking yes. still? Yeah. Well, okay. I don't know if I would do the gold stripe. I, I'd want to see what it looked like. I'm, I may, but I'll definitely have the green interlocking ND for sure. Yeah. For sure. Like I'd, yeah. I'd rather have that on the pants than like having it right here, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah, I think that'd look sharp. But I mean, I'm doing it for like one game a year. But yeah. like, I just think that would look really cool. So that, that's my two cents. I, I imagine I don't, I don't most even people think... won't like that. I, about, I don't think you'll be in the minority for that one, actually. I don't think you will. Because, I mean, it, it would mean a change from the mustards, right? So, like, that would be a thing. Well, that it's more so like. that people want to change from the mustard, but they want it to still be gold. They want it to be more of a gold. Because Notre Dame's, other than Shamrock Series games, I don't know that Notre Dame's ever worn anything but gold pants. I don't, I don't believe they have. But, like, you know what made me think of it, Ryan, was I was looking – I remember thinking of, like, the Yankee Stadium games, the game. And remembering, like, I really liked the white pant, blue top look. Now, I understand some people didn't like the, sh- the stripes. I, yeah. I, I, I was fine with it because of where you're you're playing in Yankee Stadium, right? So sure. I, I got it. But I just thought the white and the blue looked really sharp. And, and, and I didn't – I had no problem with the helmet that game if I just take away the fact that I don't ever want to mess with the helmet. But that's the thing. Like, what would it look like if the helmet was still gold? And they had those – I think that would have been – that would have looked awesome. So – but, you know, I, I just – that's just kind of my thing. But, like, the helmet's the one thing I'm not messing with. The jersey, to a degree, I'm not messing with. People want to put names in the back, whatever. I don't care. I mean, I don't – I wouldn't, but I'm I'm okay with it. But I think the pants and the gloves and the hats and the and the, the cleats, I think you could do some stuff with that would make it look really sharp and really modern. And especially since you're playing on turf now. Yeah. It's not like you're going to be in these muddy games where, you're, you know, your white pants get all torn up. Those are things that I would do if it was up to me. Just, just my, just my two cents. All right, we got another super chat here from J.K.R. Myers. This is Brian and Ryan. Hard to catch you live. Is there a schedule? By the way, I was at the 2007 fantasy camp. Coach Lewis was the favorite. I think Coach Brown was was uh, <laughs> certifiably crazy, but I figured that was a good DC trait. Well, okay. I, want to make I don't sure mean, I read to, that I don't mean to make said. light of his of what's happened to him in his life, but I think and I'm not saying this flippantly, but I think we, we came to find out that he had some problems. There were some things wrong with him. Yeah. Um, he punched out another coach in the head coach's office. And at the time you thought about it and you're like, well, yeah, cause I knew who that coach was and I would have punched the guy out too. But then you find out like that was just one of many things. And the guy just, the guy needed help. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm not saying that to make light of it, but yeah, he was, he was, there was something off with that guy big time, but yeah, Bill Lewis was and. 
was always so decent to the media, just very, you know, from everybody I've told, I, I never, he was, he left, I think before I got there, but just talking to other people, I, he was Bill, Bob, coach Elliott was great to them. He was so kind, so nice, such a, a, a just a great gentleman. Uh, I was very sad to hear that he, he passed away a few years back, but uh, schedule wise, Monday, we go at two o'clock Tuesday to Friday, we go at one o'clock and then we have a six o'clock show every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday for now. Although uh, we'll eventually get back to having our Thursday shows, the Saturday show is a little on the, up in the air right now, just from a time frame standpoint. But usually, if we have it, it'll be at two o'clock. So Monday, Saturday, two o'clock; Tuesday to Friday, one o'clock. That is that is our schedule. All right, let's get to some more questions here, Mister Roberts. Here's another one from John A. One. I think this is the last of John's questions. Should Notre Dame make a similar deal with the Big Ten like it has with the ACC this, with less games, three to four? Well, the, you'd have to get rid of the big the ACC schedule. You couldn't play right. five ACC games a year and then three to four Big Ten games a year, and then you've got, you, you've got Navy. So now like 10 of your 12 games are now taken up by, you know, good programs i don't know if i would love that it gives you less flexibility to go around and play other teams because then with those two games ryan you basically have to play like bowling green Cup and cakes yeah. yeah i mean and and i don't love that idea i, I like that they're playing texas a and i like that they've scheduled bam i like that they scheduled florida i, I like you know i want to see more of that so you know i i wouldn't necessarily do that now if you were to say hey we're going to get rid of the acc schedule and instead of doing the acc schedule we're going to be you know sort of a co-partner with the Big Ten, and our other sports are going to be in the Big Ten. I, I don't like the Big Ten. I don't. I don't want the Big Ten to be a part of anything Notre Dame does. But if they wanted to go that route, as long as it's not full membership for football, I'm fine. Play a four to five game schedule against the Big Ten every year, and you know, you know two to three against the ACC, and you know, just keep it smaller. I would say that. Like if you said two games a year with the Big Ten or three at the most, I'd say okay, I can I can dig that as long as we have some sort of um, saying it, you know, because I don't want you to give yeah. us Michigan, 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 Ohio State, and Penn State one year. You know, we've also got to play Bama and USC. And, you know what I mean? Like, there need throw, to be throw, some throw a Rutgers you know. in there. You got to throw a Rutgers right. in there, occasionally. right? Right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And come so, to Rutgers so I can go to the game. That would be a fantastic go. little thing. There you go. Yeah. Or just play Syracuse again. And every every they'll once every now twenty years they'll actually play in the dome. Normally they play at the Meadowlands, which would work for you as well. So there you go. That would definitely work for me. That would definitely work for me. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Michael Collins uh, with another soup with another question. Here we go, Michael. Are there any early front runners for the general manager position? Does it make sense for Chad Bowden to be named or stay in the current role? Did Bill Reese leave Notre Dame or is he on the staff? I don't know if he's left for sure yet, but he will not be part of Notre Dame moving forward if he, if he hasn't already done so and i was actually told that that was going to happen at the bowl game so that was always going to be in play early front runner i i don't know that there is one right now does it make sense for chad bow to be named or stay in his current role it depends on what that role is going to be yeah you know i i think that the reality is is i think that general manager job and how i envision it needs to be more of a i need to make sure everybody's on the same page and everybody's moving in the same direction and that i'm in charge of okay people that are scouting college football like it, it, the gm's got to have people that are it, it's almost like an nfl gm to some degree in that i've got a department that does scouting of other college football teams so we know who's out there uh, i have a scout, a group that's in charge of recruiting high school players and doing that part of it. I need to make sure all the coaches are on the same page and all those type of things. So, in, and I need to make sure everybody's on the same page for me. That person doesn't need to be like an NFL GM where they're having a strong say in who they decide on. That right. should be coaches and Chad. And that's where that should be. And Chad needs, and the reason I don't want Chad in this job per se is because if it goes in that role, I think that takes away from what Chad does best, which is recruit the players. I mean, that, that's yeah. the thing is recruiting players and he's got a very good eye for talent. And so that's, that would be my hesitancy to having him in a traditional GM role is you're taking that away from him a little bit. 
So as long as as long as he would be able to do that, then I'd be fine with him taking that role. But I think that needs to be more from an executive position, someone who's guiding everyone, making sure everybody's on the same page. We're communicating. Our scholarship numbers are here. We've got to be careful there. We've got to make sure that everyone's on the same page. That person can then, you know, maybe hold coaches accountable if they're not doing their job. But at the end of the day, the difference between a GM in this situation, the NFL is the head coach and college should always, always be at the very top of the food chain. I don't believe that to be true in the NFL. And part of that is because in the NFL, you have a salary cap to deal with and a lot of different rules to acquiring talent and tampering that you, you can't have a coach involved in. That's not the case in, in here in college football. The head coach should always be on the top of the food chain in college football, in my opinion. And, and I wouldn't even have the GM number two per se. It would be more of a player person, a, a more advanced player personnel type of thing would be what I would want to do. I don't want to have a GM that's like going to tell the coach, well, I know you may like this player, but we're going to take this kid instead. That That's not what I want to see. This is such a foreign concept. I, I mean, I guess my first question for if even trying to figure out who early front runners are for this position, like what pool are you pulling from? I, I don't, is, is there an answer there, Brian? Like what, what, what is like, if I'm trying to find a general manager candidate at Notre Dame, like where am I looking? is my question, right? Am I looking for a guy that has a player personnel background? Am I looking for a guy that's coming? Like where, what type of person am I looking for in that position? Cause it's just such a new concept, you know, like I, I honestly don't understand. Like, I would just like to know like what, I mean, cause if you're have a coaching hire, I know what pool I'm looking for. I'm looking for another coach, right? But this is such a new position. It's like player personnel side, organizational side. Do you want a football guy? Do you want a guy that's just more of a, is like a more of an organizational perspective type of dude. Like what pool are you pulling from? Sure I mean, that's, that, that, I don't, that's I don't know. the question. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I think, I think in college football, it, it, Ryan, it can go in different directions. Some team may do it this way. Like Clark Lee has Bart. That's kind of the role that Barton Simmons has at Vanderbilt. Yeah. Which I think maybe it'd be a little bit different than maybe what it is at Notre Dame. As long as Ron Paulus isn't considered for that job, I mean, I'm open to a lot of different candidates, and I'm sure. not saying that flippantly. Yeah, uh, I think there's a lot of things that, that that role could do well, but I want it to be more of an overseer, keeping everyone on the same page and doing things like that. Someone who may be a face of the program. I think somebody made a good point about Jerome Bettis. I don't know if Jerome would want that job, but like, it also is not bad to have someone who's a name, you know. So like, this is the GM. So it's a big name. He may not have the pull that Chad has or that coach Freeman has, but when kids are on campus, that's another big name in a, in a very important position. And it, cause it would be an important position. It's just not a final say position, right? It's not like right. a ceremonial thing, but if you could get like a Jerome Bettis, for example, that, that David Jones brought up, boy, that'd be great. Cause David could have coach Bettis or Jerome would have some roles and responsibilities and things like that. But he's also, like the head coach of a figurehead. He's someone that, Assembly. wow, I, yeah. you know, I, I got, you know, so-and-so showed me around. So then you've got two huge recruits on campus. Coach Freeman's over here with this kid. And then coach Bettis is over here with this kid. And then they switch. And it's like that kid just, you know, with, with somebody big time the entire time. And so uh, it, there's a lot of different ways you can go with it. You just, you just got to make sure that you, it's very clearly defined. Yeah. And, and Marcus, here's the thing. Marcus Freeman better be the one designing what the GM's going to do. If this is Jack and Ron enforcing what the GM's going to do on him, that's a mistake. And it wouldn't surprise me. If, I don't have any evidence that that's what they're doing. So hear me. I have no evidence of that. That's my fear, however, that it's going to be the case. And so um, that would be a, a big concern. And somebody asked, is Dave Polokan qualified? Not even close. I would not have Dave Polokan working in my football office in about any capacity. So, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. All right, let's get to the next question here. Irish blooded with a question mark. Here we go. What would you think of Notre Dame remaining its renaming, renaming its basketball co uh, court after Coach McGraw, M Coach McGraw and if there are any – let me restart this. I cannot read right now. What would you think of Notre Dame renaming its basketball court after Coach McGraw? And is there any other Power Five courts named after a female coach? Good question. I don't know uh, if there are, to be honest with you. 
Uh, I don't know. Does every men's and women's team play in the same? Chair? I, I, mean, I imagine, all, I imagine a lot too, arena? probably. Well, probably a lot too. I don't know if okay. everyone does though. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. So uh, I, I would imagine they do. I'd have no problem with it. Like if I, I don't know if like if you start Tennessee, I could see Tennessee doing something like that for, for Pat Summit. That makes sense. Uh, look, there's no one in Notre Dame's history that ever came close to the success that Muffet had with all due respect <laughs> to Digger Phelps. Not, not even close. No. You're talking about someone who won two national championships in two different eras. Right, uh, has been to the final four. I mean, how many times? I'm actually going to look it up. I mean, uh, a lot of times. I mean, even in the yeah. last decade, she was in the of you know, her career, she was there a lot of different times. So, you know, Coach McGraw, four time AP coach of the year, three time Naismith coach of the year, three time USB, uh, USBWA coach of the year. Uh, she won, see, two national titles. She was in nine final fours. Uh, she won five ACC championships. She won three Big East regular season championships. Uh, I mean, you're talking about someone who just was a dominant, dominant coach for a long time. A rec- had had over 800 wins at Notre Dame. Over 800 wins at Notre Dame. Has over 900 wins for her career. She won 30 or more games in, let's see, one, two, three, four, eight, nine of her last 10 seasons. She won <laughs> silly, 30 man. or more games. Silly. And so, yeah. The basketball, if they want to name the basketball, have Muffet's name on the basketball court, yeah, go for it. Like, why not? If a bat, if a men's coach had the success that Muffet had for as long as Muffet had it, Coach McGraw had it, his name absolutely would be on the court the minute he oh, no retired. Doubt. No doubt. You yeah. know what I mean? So, yeah, I, I would absolutely. Uh, now, again, here's, here's the problem. Uh, I'm going to actually, I don't, I know it's per self pavilion. Let, let me see what if is the court name something different? It's per cell pavilion at the Joyce Center. So here's the here's let me see. I'm curious what per cell is named after. Uh, named the man here, Philip J. Purcell. I would imagine that person got their name from donors. You know what I mean? Uh, or from that person giving money. So that would make it, you know, then it's what Muffet McGraw court in Purcell Pavilion in yeah. the Joyce Center. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like it gets a little goofy at that point in time. But yeah, I mean, it, it I, first of all, I would never name a court after someone. I would maybe name the facilities after it. But if you're going to do that si- sort of thing, Gino, Pat Summit, and Muffin McGraw should all, I don't care what their men's teams did. Their men teams never came close to the success that they had. Just and and UConn's men's basketball team has won a couple championships. Yeah. Right? They've won three, right? Ollie won one, and then Jim Calhoun won two, didn't he? Jim Calhoun did a great three. job with that program. Yeah. But with yeah. all due respect, Gino's had more like straight national titles <laughs> than, <laughs> than the men, right? I mean, I believe I'm correct on that. Didn't they win three titles Gino. at one point in time in his career? G- it was a ridiculous stretch that UConn was on, yeah, they, man. Ridiculous yeah, stretch. yeah, they had they've twice they've no they they've won they won three in a row from 01 to 04, and then they won four in a row from 12 13 to 15 16. So yeah, so uh, and, and, and and if it wasn't for Muffet, Gino would have a couple more national titles. It's true. It's true. Pat Summit so, was a good mention too, man. Yeah. Uh, her consistency she had throughout her career was wild remember the candace parker years they were incredible absolutely to back up my point from night from the 1999 to 2000 season through the 2003-04 season that's a stretch of five years uconn won four national titles the one year they didn't win the national title was the 2000-2001 season when notre dame won it with niel ivy and ruth riley if you remember that team at all ryan so uh yeah I would say, like I said, if it wasn't for uh, for Muffet, <laughs> Gino would probably have a couple other uh, national titles in his, in, in his in his docket. Like I know they beat him well, a couple years ago, right? Um, yeah, in, in the championship yeah. game or Final Four, right? Erika Agumba Wale, she one of the Final Four game. They beat Mississippi State in the championship game, but she hit a bucket at the end against UConn to beat them in that season as well. So, yeah, I would say. I want to. I, I want to yeah. look up Gino's career record. It's probably like the it's most ridiculous. ridiculous thing of all time. Yeah. He's won 1,011, 1,171 games. He's won and he's lost one hundred fifty five. His, <laughs> his 
his conference record is 568 and 64. That's it's gross, just man. stupid. You got over yeah. a thousand more wins and losses. That's just yeah. wild. The last time that his team did not make the final four was the 2006 and 2007 season where they didn't it's make the final good. four. And, and I don't count the COVID year because nobody made it that year. So it's a decent yeah. year, decent run, decent run. Gino yeah. Rihanna has been on. Yeah. Not bad, but yes, if you're going to, if you're into the naming courts after coaches, then absolutely Muffin McGraw deserves to have the court at Notre Dame named after her. No question. No question. We don't get many women's basketball questions here. So that's a, that's a good one. Uh, let's go from Joe Papiti. Joe says with all the decent openings in the, in the national football league, do you find it troubling? Interesting that golden was not interviewed. I don't, I don't know that, uh, he wasn't interviewed. I don't know that he was or wasn't. I mean, just because he didn't get a job or take a job doesn't mean he wasn't interviewed. And I'm not, I'm not leaking something or hinting at something. I'm saying I don't know. Just because we didn't hear anything doesn't mean that it didn't happen, right? And you all, um, you also you also don't get a lot of like you don't get a lot of coordinator to coordinator from college to the NFL a ton. Like that doesn't happen a ton, really. Well, when it you would make sense it. for him because he would, he, if, if Al Golden didn't come to Notre Dame, he's a guy that's on the verge of getting a coordinator job in the NFL based on the, you know, the experience he had. Uh, we had heard plenty that the, if the DC from the Bengals was going to get the Arizona job, that he was going to bring Al Golden with him to be the D coordinator. That's what we had heard. Sure. So it, it'll happen if you have a guy that has an NFL experience. And Al Golden was building up a pretty good reputation as a position coach in the NFL. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm not – I don't find it troubling at all. Uh, find it interesting at all. I mean, that's just kind of how it goes. It's it's And there's still plenty of jobs to be had. I kind of wish he'd go back to the NFL just because I think that's where his heart is, to be honest with you. I don't – I he has not shown me that he has a passion for being a college football coach again. The, the, like for him, grinding on the recruiting trail is literally throwing out more linebacker offers than I've ever seen in my life. Only be only to be outdone by the number of defensive line offers they've put out this year. They have 25, it, it's absurd. Li- 25 it's linebacker absurd. offers right now. Yeah. And so it's like you got to eventually start recruiting someone. You know what I mean? And so uh, I just, I don't know if he has the grind. Now, I, I think Al, here's the thing Al Golden. I've said this from the minute he was hired, before he was hired. He is a good, decent man, he, and he's a good football coach. I just don't think he's cut out for the current college game in 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 certain ways. Meaning, you gotta you gotta bring your level down to ma- match what the kids can do. Number one, I don't think he wants to do that. He wants to be the NFL guy. Number two, you've got to deal with the NIL. You've got to you, you got to deal with the NFL NIL stuff. Just a part of it. Number three. In college, you've got to rec- you've got to coach your whole roster, right? Your whole depth chart. You're not just your starters and your key reserves. And number four, you got to put in work on the recruiting trail. And in none of those areas has he shown me a willingness to do that right now, right? And so that's why I'm critical of him. I don't like being critical of him. I've met Al Golden three or four times back in my coaching career, and he was a good, decent, respectful man. He did not big time th- th- us because we were at smaller levels. Very good man. Very smart. It's just I don't think that he is willing to do what it takes to be a great college coach right now, in my opinion. That's my concern. If yeah. Al Golden have sort of a, a come to Jesus moment this offseason and realize, like, look, I want to be in college, I want to impact people's lives, and he, and he wanted to do it, then he would be fine. He would be great, in my opinion, because it would mean he'd he'd bring the offense, the defense down, and it's not always as much about how smart he is. He would start coaching the entire group, and he would start grinding on the recruiting trail. And if he did that, Ryan, I. Great, because he is a smart guy. It's just I don't think he's willing to do that. That's my concern. And if he is, then we're fine. And I'm glad NFL teams aren't coming at him, right? I mean, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. All right, next question here from uh, – I'm going to go – I'm going to skip some of these GMs because I think we kind of already talked about those. we got one from Tyler Erig. Just wondering why the quarterback coach hiring hasn't officially been announced yet. Didn't right. think the administration process would take this long. Talk I should have, I should have. Yeah. yeah, I didn't, I didn't quite read that one, but yeah, look, it, it's been less than a week. Yeah. I mean, it was what announced, what day was it announced? It was this week, correct? Wasn't it earlier this week that Gino was, yeah. that we, we got word of, uh, Gino Gadouli was going to be the guy, correct? What day did we publish that story? 
I thought it was last week. Wasn't no, it, it was last week. It would have been the yeah. 15th. So yeah. we're nine days. It's not that far off. And honestly, yeah. part of it is because they had the they had the thing with the coach this week. You know, they're going through these interview hires. I, I'm just I, I'm just not worried about it. There's no there's no holdups. There's no hiccups. There's no issues. Yeah. Just just on, it's just onboarding stuff. I mean, that, yes. I mean, why did it take so little time for Jared Parker to make? Because he was on staff already. You already had right. the background check stuff done. Right. I mean, that stuff is already done with. So it's just and people stuff. freaked out about how long it took with Harry last year too. It's just there's just yeah. contract negotiations and not negotiations, but like contract things that have to get worked out because he's going from one contract to another. So you got to get yeah. certain things done and things like that. It just takes a little bit of time. Yep. Here's one, Ryan. I'm going to ask you for a first. So James Delaney says thoughts on the Ravens hiring Todd Munkin from Georgia. I loved it for, for the Ravens. I think that you, the issue with the previous offensive coordinator, Greg Roman with the Baltimore Ravens was it was great when he first got with the Ravens because he really accentuated some of the stuff that Lamar Jackson's excelled, excelled at in the run game. But I don't think it ever evolved after that. It was just kind of the same. And you just kind of, you know, the passing game never really took a massive step forward because I think you were just so preoccupied with being more of a niche type of, you know, specific offense. I think Todd Munkin can has shown that he can adjust to what his personnel is. But more than anything, I think that he has the ability to open up the passing game a little bit for the Baltimore Ravens. I don't think we've seen the best, and you know, and this is obviously assuming that they do get Lamar Jackson back, right? I mean, that is an assumption that I'm carrying. But if they do, I think that I still think there's a level of passing prowess that Lamar has not gotten to yet because I think that there just was not an emphasis on, hey, man, let's start putting more on your plate. Let's start opening things up a little bit. Let's start getting a little more creative in the passing game. It was just always about let's make the quarterback run game great. Let's make the running game great. And that's awesome. But there's a well-roundedness that I think that the Baltimore Ravens have lacked over the years from a passing game perspective. So I think Todd Munkin showed at Georgia that, and he even showed in the NFL before obviously his final stop there, that he can get a lot out of a passing game. He can get a lot out of an offense, and I think he's a really bright offensive mind. So I thought it was a really good hire from Baltimore, and I think that he has a chance. As long as Lamar comes back, they can figure out those contractual stuff, and they you know, continue to build talent in the passing, you know, in the passing weapons. I think that it could be a really good hire potentially for them. I think the thing too, is you've seen Todd Munkin run different types of offenses, as you said, Ryan. I mean, what he ran at Oklahoma state is way different than what he ran in Georgia. Way different. I, I think the thing for me is a lot of stuff he's, he, he, he'll do is going to be for um, like play action pass game, I think that's going to be good. He does a lot of a lot of stuff to try to. He does. He did a really nice job this year. I thought with ISOs using motions and shifts and, and post snap movement to create you know a, to get a guy open. So there's stuff like that in the NFL. The thing for me with Lamar is just going to be where's his head at, right? And, yeah. and that's always a concern for quarterbacks as they enter this part of his career. It's not unique to Lamar. It's it's true for all quarterbacks as they kind of get into this thing. Where okay, is your contract the thing that dominates your your mindset? Or are you letting your agents handle that and you're doing this? Well, here's the problem. Lamar's agent is him and his mom. I'm about to say he doesn't have right? an agent. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's a problem for me, you know, for him, because now he has to have more mental space taken up into this. And that's concerning to me. That's my concern with Lamar. And I've said before, Ryan, the issue with the Ravens for me is they did not build the offense to his to to where they in a way where you had to get more out of him. They just kind of put him in this box and just kind of left him in that box. No evolution. And I think Todd yeah. Monken will do that, where he can take advantage of, of uh, sort of – you can take advantage of the legs, and you'd be foolish not to. But when you got J.K. Dobbins, you can let J.K. be your primary runner, and you can let uh, Lamar kind of be in more of a Steve Young, John Elway role now as he gets older in his career, and he's had a couple injuries, where he's running off script as not so much of the design runs but letting him be more of an effective because the more effective he is as a passer, the more run lanes are going to come open as a scrambler, in my opinion, because you have to defend that part of your game more. And so, yeah, I agree. And I think Todd Munkin's a guy that will be, able, I mean, look, if, if Todd Munkin can turn Stetson Bennett into a two-time national champion, I think he can do some stuff with Lamar Jackson. And, and the same I, age. I mean, you know, so that helps. I, I think a lot of the pr same principle, uh, the principles stay the same with the Baltimore Ravens too. They're always going to be one. Of, they're always going to want to be a team that wants to run the football. Yeah, Todd Monken showed that he could do that. 
Todd Monk can also show that he can do a lot with multiple tight end sets. And that has been something that the Baltimore Ravens have built their niche off of the last few years. I mean, everyone talks about Mark Andrews, but they have guys like Nick Boyle that rotate in frequently as in two tight end sets, sometimes in some 13 personnel. They want to use multiple tight ends. They want to run the football. Todd Munkin could do those things on top of opening the passing game, in my opinion. Yeah. Now, look, I, I think that there's some personnel as I look at the Ravens. I also still think there's some personnel things they've got to do differently. I think if you're going to run the things that they're going to run, I think you need to have home run hitters at least one big home run hitter at receiver. Uh, you have to have someone that scares teams and forces them to defend down the field. They kind of got rid of that guy, right, in, in in Hollywood. Now, I don't know if he was that guy still in college or in the NFL, Ryan, but, like, to me, to run this offense, you need um, a guy, a, a Tyreek Hill, a, yeah. so, someone like him where it's just a stretch-the-field guy. Because otherwise, if you're you, – you can't run a lot of 15 and in uh, – routes where if you're, if you're a team that's also running the football you have to be able to throw the ball down the field you have to be able to throw down the field preferably for me i want a big guy and a fast guy is what i want on the outside i think that's the thing too is you've got to complement that that other group with the with the and i think that's what they were trying to get out of miles boykin he just you know just wasn't that guy He's not but that like guy. to me that would be kind of what i'd be looking for is you've got you've got to have some guys to stretch field because mark andrews is a good football player very good you know and and but he can't be your guy. He can't be your number one. He's got to be your number two or three. And you need, you need, you need some receivers can do more. And until they do that, I think that's going to hold their offense back as well. In my well Lamar has always really struggled to throw outside the numbers for some reason mm -hmm. too. So there needs to be some type of understanding of how to improve that. I mean, he's and, always been yeah, really why? good to the middle of the field. Why is that? Why are there so much struggles outside the numbers? Is that because the wide receivers aren't good? Is that because it's not what he's comfortable with? Like there has to be some understanding. Is that a there. system problem? Yeah, I think that's fair, Ryan, because I think to me that's – but that's part of the reason I think that they need to have a home run hitter because now you're playing to his strengths. Because the one thing I've always – you've watched him a lot more in the NFL than I have, so you can you can correct me. One of the things I thought in college, I thought Lamar was one of the best deep ball throwers I've seen in college football. He doesn't really throw the ball deep at all right now. Which yeah, is just, I mean, yeah, he was yeah. a really good deep ball thrower in college. And – you know, he's he's never been super great outside the numbers. Even in college, he was not a he was he was not he was below 50 percent past 10 yards uh, in college in, in 2017. 2016, he was better uh, throwing that 10 to 19 range. He was over 50 percent those years, but he likes to throw the ball right down the middle of the field. When throws. He loves posts yes. and deep overs and stuff like that. That's where he's comfortable. And you've got to have a burner or you you can't hit those routes if you don't have a burner. That, that's in my opinion. I don't care what level you're at. So they're going to have to get that guy, in my opinion. And I, I think the other thing, too, is throwing the ball outside is just something that you've got to figure out what how to get him mentally comfortable with that, Yeah, in my view, because he and hasn't fun. really been in that kind of offense. That's not really what they were at Louisville, in my and view. And find some concepts that he's comfortable with, at least. You can't just, it, you can't just ignore a part of the right. field. It's like you just can't. But that's it. also why you need a big guy, a, a guy that can just, hey, this guy's big and strong. Just let give him let let him get the ball get the ball out there to him. I think those things all can 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 help in my opinion. All right, we got some more here. We got Irish in Ohio with a question here, Ryan. How confident are you guys that Al Golden and Al Washington will make the necessary changes for the upcoming season? Uh, I mean, how can you be confident in that right now? I mean, this is it, this is a this is a prove it time for me, Brian. Right, like this is a massive offseason for both of the Owls. It, I think it's in both of them that they can improve and be much better in, in their capacities on the, on the football field, on the football team. But I mean, how confident am I? I, I'm not confident at all. I would love to be cautiously optimistic, but there was nothing from the 2022 season that tells me or anything that, you know, I'm continuing to hear that I say, you know what? They're growing, they're evolving. I hope it happens, but I mean, I'm not optimistic at all at the moment. Yeah. Same. Um, I'm not optimistic. I'm going to make changes. Yeah. Yeah. I hope they do. I mean, for the betterment of the program, I, I'm very much hoping that the switch gets yeah. clicked on. Because, I got to see it, Ryan. That's yeah. where I'm at, man. I got to see it. Yep. I got to see it. Antoine Johnson, our resident Michigan fan, says, uh, has a, also has a question here for us, Ryan. Antoine, what's up? In fact, they should hire social media teams, but college football moves like the government. They're slow and oftentimes not willing to do stuff. Not wrong. Agree. Not wrong. Agree. <laughs> Notre Dame should always be an innovative program. 
And that's one of the most maddening things about following their name over the years. Newt Rockney was an innovator. He was always ahead of the game. Like I remember getting in these scoreboard arguments with some of the old heads, right? Oh, you know, Newt Rockney wouldn't have had a scoreboard. Newt Rockney would have been the first person with a scoreboard in college football <laughs> if they were around back then. Because he wanted to be the, the number was one, right? always revolutionary yeah. with the forward pass, revolutionary with yeah. traveling across the country. He was revolutionary with the stadium. He was a revolutionary when it came to college football. Pat, you know, Frank Leahy was a little bit more of a traditionalist. But that's fine. It's, it worked. It was worked phenomenally well. But like your foundation, you always trace it back to Newt. It's the house that Newt built and Rockney built and all this stuff, right? He wasn't a, always a, an ahead of the game guy. And to me, one of the most frustrating things in Notre Dame is they've always been reactionary and they've never been innovative. Hey, NIL's here. Okay. We don't want to get into the pay for play. Cool. I have said a million times, I support that. But that doesn't mean there aren't other things that you should be doing to it. This it, it is the reality of NIL. And the AD always says we think the player should be taken better care of. Okay, cool. Then you need to make sure that your your communications department and your football program is doing more and more and more to promote these student athletes. That involves more media accessibility, right? It involves uh more practice access. It involves making sure your video teams and your communication teams and your media teams are doing more and more and more to promote your student athletes on social media, you know, putting more videos out, having a team dedicated to the big sports. You know what I mean? Like those things need to be part of it and you should be ahead of the game. You should be having everyone else trying to keep up with you in these areas because you're not going to be out there courting donors to come give guys money. Totally. I'm, I'm good with that. Right. But you need to be doing things and making sure that you're giving your players the biggest platform possible. And just saying you're at Notre Dame, you have the biggest platform possible is BS because this isn't the 1960s anymore. It's not the 1980s anymore. Social media has allowed other people to catch up with Notre Dame from a notoriety standpoint. That's just a fact. Plus, you haven't won a title in 35 years, right? So now you need to say, okay, we can't just rest on what we did 50 years ago anymore. We need to be the trendsetters. We need to be the ones saying we're doing this for our student. Look what we're doing to put our student athletes and our students at Notre Dame in position to do these things. Because there are so many things that you could tap into the academic side of the school and some of the different programs to say, hey, we're going to have your kids. Like I would have interns that are part from like the math program that are like, hey, I want to get some stats whiz to help us with our analytics or whatever the case may be. You know, get kids from your from your film and media degree, which they have in Notre Dame, to help with different things on campus and start it, really making it campus wide and use some of those resources if you don't want to have to pay $100,000 per employee to bring those positions in. Now you're really making it awesome and you're really creating some of those opportunities. And so there's just so many different things that I wish Notre Dame would be more ahead of the game on and understand the power of social media is something that this school just they like here's the thing right when they actually do things they're usually really good it's just way too infrequent and then there's a lot of other areas where they're not taking advantage of the opportunities like look we're here use us to build your student athletes up right like it just it, yeah it makes no sense it just makes no sense to me that they don't do more of that they're just i don't know what it is but Notre Dame should always be innovative. They shouldn't be reactionary. They should be innovative. And right now, they're just they're they're incre- they're slow reactionaries. You are correct. There's no question about it. And it's a little frustrating, right? And all the cool stuff you're doing, you see from the football team, like Chad's done a lot of really good stuff, and Coach Freeman's done some good stuff. But they can't do it on their own. They can't film practices on their own and put the videos together on their own. You need a team to do that, and they need to they need to do more in that. Because there's some really smart people in Notre Dame that if you just said, sick them, this is the thing I want. Now go get it. And they could do it. They could do a great job with it. You just got to say, this is the priority. You know, and then in some positions where I don't think they have necessarily the best people in position to do those jobs, then find someone. You know, you, you always pride yourself on being this elite institution. You should have, you should take pride in having the people in charge of every aspect of your campus be the best that you can possibly get. Not the cheapest, but the best. And, and that's one of my big frustrations with Notre Dame right now, to be completely honest with you. Because I know the money's there. It's just about whether or not they choose to spend it on those things. And right now they're not, at least not to the degree they need to. We have one here from 10 Day. 
Tenday's got a question as well. So Brian Ryan, what's worse or better, winning as coach at Notre Dame or winning as quarterback at Notre Dame without a championship? The coaching one's worse for me because to me, the quarterback is a byproduct of the team that he's he's around yeah. and good or bad. And, and the, the quarterback, like, for example, Jimmy Clausen is not at fault for the defense in 09 stinking. Right. Brady Quinn is not at fault for the defense not giving up a fourth and nine or giving up a fourth and nine against USC. Right. He did his job. He got him down there against USC, got him a touchdown, a couple minutes left, and and all that. The players are always beholden to the the, the overall job that the head coach does. Do you give me the resources and tools I need around me to go win? So, yes, absolutely. I, I always put that on the coach. You, 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 the winning is coach at Notre Dame thing that Brian Kelly currently owns is it's a lifetime achievement award. It, it's not yeah. a greatness award. You just coached longer and everybody else in an era where you played more games per season. You're also a coach who got much easier schedules by and large than your predecessors. And your schedules during the stretch where you were really good were all much easier than the stretch schedules you had when you're going eight and five, nine and four every year. So I think that's part of it as well. But you know, to me, at Notre Dame, a place like Notre Dame, greatness is measured by championships. And Brian Kelly has none. So he's not the winningest coach in Notre Dame in any other way other than the longevity. He's like eighth in winning percentage, right? Of monks. Of coaches who have been at Notre Dame for at least five seasons, he's like eighth in win percentage. True, true. That's not hyperbole. That's fact. I looked that up. And so I just don't really care about, oh, you were there long. That means Notre Dame settled. That's what that means, yeah. right? So, um, yeah. I, I don't. I don't. I also just don't like blaming kids for ineptitude, right? I, I just think that that's a coaching thing. Like that's the first and foremost I always look at is say, you know, that's the. It's going to be on your record. It's going to be next to your name. And, you know, what happens on the field on Saturdays is a byproduct of what the coach recruited, what the coach designed, the game plan put together, all those types of things. So it's always Coach May. I mean, to me, the other thing too, Ryan, is I just – with the Ian Book thing, I'm not a big Ian Book fan. You know that. You know my reasons why. Yeah. Part of the reason is just the manner in which he was hyped. You know, like the Super Bowl. Uh, he's the backup quarterback. Who has he played? A, did he play a snap this year? No, he did not. Like he Notre was also in, all, he was also inactive in the Super Bowl. I like believe, to me, so. it's so disrespectful yeah. to Tony Rice and and the Brady Quins and the of the yeah. world, the Joe Thies, Theismans, the Joe Montanas, the 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 John Hewards, the Angelo Bertellis, the Johnny Lujacks of the world. When you keep calling him, you're winning as quarterback. You know, because those guys were better players and most of them won championships. Tony Rice won more games against top 25 teams in 1989 alone than than Ian Book won in three years as a starting quarterback. He went five and five against ranked teams. He went 20 and 0 against unranked teams. That doesn't define greatness. Tony Rice beating, I think, I think it was like seven or eight top 10 teams in his two years as a starter. That matters to me, including, I don't know, winning a championship. You know what I mean? Like those are the things that really like just that bothers me. It's like, it's disrespectful to me when you, when you keep calling him that, because again, it's, it's, he played in an era where teams played more games. It was easier for him to start for multiple years because of how bad this, how bad recruiting at the position was. You know, like Tony Rice had to beat out Kent Graham, right? I mean, Kent Graham went and played in the NFL. So it just – those things kind of frustrate me. I mean, because, again, I'll, I'll say it again. The year that Tony Rice won his national title, Notre Dame had to beat – and this is end of the season rankings. Number four, Michigan. Number seven, USC. Number two, Miami. And number five, West Virginia. That's who Notre Dame had to beat that year in, in, in 1988 to win a national championship. Like, I'd say that's pretty good. Wouldn't you, Ryan? And then the next year, uh, to, to they went, they went, they finished, I think, number, what they finished that year? Number two, number two in the AP that year, 1989. They beat number four, Colorado, the end of the season. This is end of season rankings. They beat number four, Colorado. They beat number seven, Michigan. They beat number 16, Michigan State. They beat number eight, USC. 
They beat number – did they play Tennessee that year? No, they played Pitt. What did Pitt finish that year? They beat number uh, 15 Penn State, beat number 17 Pitt, and their only loss was to the national champion Miami team. That's impressive to me. Not going 5-5 five and five against top 25 teams, but 20-0 and 0 against unranked teams. So stop calling him the winningest all-time quarterback because he's because you, you make me say things like this. Because it's a slap in the face of the great ones that came before him. I, I'm I'm sorry. It just frustrates me. If you want to talk about a modern quarterback being winning, winning his quarterback, how about we start talking? How about we start putting more respect on Tony Rice's name as an institution? The guy that won your last championship and beat how many top 10 teams that I just named in that two-year stretch, right? Guy went 23-1 and one as a starter in those last two years. The only loss was to the national champions. Let's put some respect on his name a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah, good. He's got a Super Bowl ring for a team he played. Z- he played he, as many snaps for the win. Eagles last year that I played, and they didn't win the Super Bowl. They didn't win, yeah. He played as many snaps for the Eagles as I did last year. So, anyway. Next question from Ryan B. B. I have looked at other coaching staffs and have noticed that some include a Viper coach. Would having a dedicated Viper coach help us with our recruiting struggles in that area? Who are you going to fire? Right. It always comes back to I mean, that this question. This is what it comes down to. Who are you going to fire? Yeah. You only have 10 assistants. Who are you going to fire Brian Mason to get a Vipers coach? Are you going to fire your running backs coach? or I mean, who are you going to fire, right? Like, I mean, I get it. Like To me, that'd be a nice GA thing, but – I just I don't think it's needed. I think you need just a really good defensive line coach. I mean, the Viper has not been a problem in the last few years prior to 2022, right? And even the down year at Viper this past year saw the guy have 14 tackles for loss and 11 sacks in, in a year where he wasn't as good as he was the year before. So I just – give me a guy that's a better recruiter. It's, it's simple. Give me a guy that's a better recruiter. Or make Al Washington do a better job of recruiting, one or the other. But yeah. I don't think you need a, a, co- a coach for that position alone – because then you take away from the the rest of it. I just, you know, I just don't, uh, I don't think that, that, I just think that's a, I just don't think it works. I mean, again, in the NFL, okay, fine, do that. Because there's more, you can have more coaches. Yep. But in college football, you only have 10 assistants. And I mean, only, that's still a lot. It's better than what it used to be. But if you're going to hire a Vipers coach, you got to tell me who you're going to fire. So, I mean, again, Ryan, I'm, I, I like where your head's at. You're trying to find solutions. I get it. I'm all, I'm with you. But for me, it's just the solutions need to be hire better people at the jobs that you have now. Yeah. Or demand more from the guys that have those jobs now. Do that. And I think that'll that'll be fine. That'll be fine. All right. Next one from Call Me Ty. How important will Notre Dame starting 3 and 0 for the season program? I think it could build a lot of momentum knowing they could lose two games later in the season. I mean, I, mean, I think momentum is the biggest thing for me. Call me Ty. I mean, you're breaking in a new quarterback. You're breaking in a new offensive coordinator. Those things matter. And getting off to a hot start, I think could really bolster the confidence for both players. So in that regard, I think it's great, but I, I don't think that it's, I don't think that the, the, Vantage point is, you know, we're going to lose two games potentially later in the year, so we need to get off to a fast start. No, you get off to yes. a fast start so you can win those games later Correct. in the year. That's, That's the point. difference. Yeah. That's the difference. Right. So, but but regardless to the question, it's important that they get off start. You have a couple sure. cupcakes in the beginning of the year because yeah. you have breaking in a new play caller. You're breaking in a new quarterback potentially. You need to get things rolling because I mean there is a stretch of games during the middle of the season. Where the schedule gets brutal, man. It's mm-hmm. not easy. And you need to be playing good football when that stretch comes up. The, so to me, to Ty's point, I, I I think the momentum is really important. I would say 4-0 because you don't you play Ohio State in week five because yeah. uh you've got you've got uh, Navy, Tennessee State, NC State, and then Central Michigan before Ohio State. So to me, it's 4-0. Oh. But yeah. I think the, the whole point is about momentum so that you can go win those games. But I think there's also merit to the point of you can't afford a slip up early because of how difficult the rest of the schedule is. And that's why the Marshall game was so devastating. I mean, if you just be, look, forget what happened against Ohio State. They were better than you that day. Forget what happened against Ohio State, USC. They were better than you that day. If you just beat two teams that you should have flat out beat, Marshall and Stanford at home, we have a much different view of this Notre Dame football team this year. Much different view of this Notre Dame football team. 
this year. And so uh, to me, I think there's a lot of merit to that, especially like, so under Brian Kelly, I would not have said that that's all that important because Brian Kelly did a really good job of in his last five years of beating the teams you're supposed to beat, right? So they would have gained some momentum, probably beat NC State. And then you go into Ohio State 4-0. Now, I don't know how, if they'd have been able to beat Ohio State, those are games he couldn't win. Coach Freeman still needs to show that he can win those games, Ryan. He can win those games you're supposed to win. And so I do think it's important to get momentum for that regard, that reason as well. This team needs to get a boost in confidence that, hey, the message is right. It's 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 good. It works. We need to believe in it, buy into it. And I think it's it's those it's those early season wins where maybe you wipe a team out because they didn't have a, enough blowouts last year. I mean, BC was really the only true blowout because they kept letting UNLV hang around and hang around and hang around. You know, I'd say UNLV and I, I think we can count UNLV as a blowout. I mean, they should have got those backups in sooner. But those are the only two really blowouts they had. They let North Carolina kind of come back late. You could kind of call that a blowout, but like you didn't blow out Cal. You didn't blow out Marshall. You didn't blow out Stanford. You, you, there are so many games where you should have done that. You're winning close games early. That team was just fighting for survival from like the opening game of the year. Yeah, This team needs to kind of come out and say, no, we're going to set a different tone. We're going to smash Navy. We're going to smash Tennessee State. We're going to handle our business at NC State, which to me is not smashing. It's just winning, going on the road and beating a good top 25 NC State team. Just get that W, show you're the better team, come home, smash Central Michigan, and now you've built up some confidence in yourselves because confidence, Ryan, we've talked about. Momentum is confidence. That's what momentum is. You, momentum's not some like like it's like 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 this the football holy spirit, right? And you've you've got it. I've got the momentum, and I you know I'm hey you got the momentum, you know. No, that's not what momentum, momentum is. Confidence. So, sorry, I was looking away. Could you do that again? Can nope, you do that again, nope, please? Not happening. <laughs> so that was me getting the Holy Spirit. You know what I mean? But it's 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 confidence is at the foundation of momentum because confidence leads to better execution. Execution leads to better play. Better play leads to more success, and it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds. No doubt. That's that's to me where it is. And so uh, the more you do it early, the better you'll be. No so and, and somebody brought up an argument about about book and and, um, you know, hey, the, the issue is he is the winningest quarterback, not the best. And I'm saying, but but he's 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 not, though, because to me, he just played more seasons. He doesn't have a better winning percentage than Tony Rice had as a quarterback, and he has no championships. Again, I don't care about longevity awards. I care about greatness, just, and that's what call, I care about. Just call it the winningest regular season quarterback. No, just, and, uh, don't call him winningest anything. I don't care about accumulate. I mean, because otherwise, Ryan, there's be Hall of Famers that just because they pitched 25 years. Right. I mean, well, I mean, that's going to happen, though, in the NFL is that they're they're getting to a point. It's like the Frank Gore thing that we talked about. Right. It's like he played so long that he's going to make the Hall of Fame. And I'm just like, but is that actual greatness? Is, is that actual greatness, though? Right. I mean, that's my biggest right. thing. Right. I mean, we're especially in the era we play in. There's going to be so many quarterbacks that people are going to be like, that guy needs to go to the Hall of Fame. Look at those numbers. Sure. And you're just going to be like, eh, but really, though, I mean, really. Right. right. All right, just your ordinary Joe. This is a really interesting uh, uh, question or point that I just want want to address to Ryan. So why don't you read this question from just your ordinary Joe. Joe says, you know what else doesn't help the program besides practice access lockdown? Video in the locker room on game day. Creeps me out. Weirdly, what is that word? Voyeuristic. Voyeuristic, if you mm -hmm. ask me. I have no idea what that word is. Nice one, Joe. So, Joe, I am also a fan of removing cameras from the locker room. And I know for NBC, we get that, that comment of coach saying something like, so I would say you're out of the locker room until the head coach is about to address the team before the game. And you're not there at halftime. There just has to be somewhere that you know and i'm sort of making that i'm advocating for like you know more access more access more access more access there has to be some place however that's just their universe we don't need media and and cameras in the coach's office during we don't need it during team meetings we don't need it there we don't need it in the locker room at halftime we don't need it in the locker room in the game, except again, when you have them outside and when the coach is ready to dress the team, you bring them in, they can film this thing, do it for NBC and you're good to go, whatever. Right. But there needs to be a safe space. It's not safe space. That sounds really lame. There needs to be a sacred space. That's 
for the players and the coaches and the, you know, cause like you're going to have your priest there, but they're considered part of like the team for me, but like there needs to be a sacred place. That's just for them. And that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at, to be honest with you. Like, I don't, I don't like that. There's as many people on the sideline as there is. Again, I just, it's a sacred place for me. Uh, not a place where people that have a lot of money. Now, part of the sacred space is people that have, have paid their dues as players can be down there, right? If Bryant Young wants to be on the sidelines, he can be on the sidelines, right? If Joe Montana does whatever, but like some booster to me, it's like, you know, okay, game started, go, go up to your box and this is their space, right? And so to me, I think the locker room needs to be that. The practice field, I think there's, there's advantages to having people at the practice field because it raises the level of accountability, in my opinion, as well. That's another aspect to it, right? And, hey, I better bring it today because the media is here. I can't afford an off day. They're going to be writing about how bad I did. That's a good thing, in my opinion, True. for players. But when they go to the locker room, they need to be able to have that space to them. And I feel that way before a game as well. Again, if they want to bring it in there for production right when the coach is about to dress the team, that's cool. Because I would have loved to have the camera recording Lou Holt saying, save Jimmy Johnson for me. Like, I would have loved to have seen that, <laughs> right? But that's the only time. Yeah, I just think – I'm with Joe. I think that – like, like the NFL, I, I, I think it's weird and creepy in professional sports to have reporters in the locker room interviewing players. I just think that's weird. I, like, wait outside. Like, this is something Notre Dame does. Like you, you got to wait outside for the players to come out to you and they get to cry and be upset or do whatever and let them, let them deal with the emotions of what just happened. And then they, when they're ready and poised and come out and talk to us, that's exactly how it should be in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because we I don't, I belong, we, we don't belong. We don't have a right to be in there in my opinion. I, I used to have a short temper as a player sometimes too. I, I feel like I would be like, yo, can you get out of my face for a couple minutes, man? Like get, get away from me. Like, uh, yeah. So it's interesting. I haven't thought about that exclusively, but I'm just like putting myself in a player's shoe for a second. And I could just imagine like just losing a close football game and I got people like in my face with cameras and stuff like guys, like I, right. I have emotions, you know, like I'm a person here. I'm not just a football player. Like, like who, I, I can... who was it for the Bengals? Everybody got mad at that. He was yelling about something about Joseph Asai when they were walking. It was a Jermaine Pratt. Uh, Jermaine Pratt. Was? It was Jermaine Pratt. Yes. It's like, y'all. Okay. Have you? If you haven't been in that situation, then shut up. Seriously, right? you don't Seriously. understand the emo, especially in football, like competitive sports, but especially football, which is a very violent game. You you, you just lost you the understand. right to play yes. in the Super Bowl. Like, yes. come on, man. Yeah. yeah, and you had the game, right? You did. Yeah. Now yeah. you can say, okay, is it right or wrong? But it's just the heat. There's some there's some heat of the moment stuff that I just was like, you know what? We don't need that. We don't need to be there. That's their space. Yes. And I do believe that. I do believe I do believe that the players and coaches need to have a their space. You know? And, so and, and you're playing a violent game. The emotions go off the rails sometimes. I mean, Brian, like who hasn't gotten into a little bit of a pushing match or a fight during practice when you were playing right. football, right? Like that happens right. all the time. But then you right. talk about it later, you hug it out when you're in a good state of mind, and it's past it, man. Like yep. I, I was I almost fought my best friend in high school during a football, like right. football practice. But then afterwards you're like my bad, bro. Like, I don't know what I was doing there. I'm sorry. Emotions got the best to be. It's an emotional game. It's emotional. Yeah. I love this. Gavin, Gavin Harden. Ryan, how much does this loss hurt? Start swinging at reporter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about swinging, but I would tell you him, like, asked. can you give me a few minutes, please? Like, can you please get yeah. away from me? Seriously. <laughs> Derek Calmer said, Ryan needs anger management. Living with three females will do that. <laughs> I'm going to be living with four soon. So, yeah, it's yeah. going to be wild. Because you got your dog, your daughter, yeah. and your wife, right? And, it's about to and another four. daughter on the way. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I'm the one with three. I got Rita, Sadie, and Angela. So, yeah, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. Got a lot of, I got a lot of pent-upness. That's where those rants come from. I got a lot of pent-up anger and frustration I got to get out. Seriously. Seriously. Yeah. I got a super chat from Mike Rowley. I, I'm, I don't know if I'm saying that correct, Mike. If I'm saying that incorrectly, please let me know. I want to make sure I get your name right. But we got a super chat from Mike here. And his take is Notre Dame needs to go back to the early 90s uniforms, numbers, pants with the new gold helmets. Um, so I'm somewhat 
I'm I'm somewhat sympathetic to a modernized version of that because one of my favorite uniforms I've seen Notre Dame ever wear in the last decade was the the 2018 game or was it 2019 game against Boston College, the senior day, where they threw the 88 throwbacks. I love that pant helmet combination. I love the way that the jersey looked. I thought that was really sharp, Ryan. And I'm actually going to try to find a picture of it that my that my wife took from that game because uh, she does photography. But I mean. To me, Ryan, there are some really, some really interesting combinations that you could have with that. I would, I would not be opposed to something like that. I, I wouldn't. I, I think there could be some very interesting things that you could see. Here, here's. I'm gonna see if I can pull it up. Maybe super. Maybe a streamer will be working me. I, I believe I've shown this picture before, but uh, let me let me pull it up here real quick. All right, so that's a picture that my wife took of Alohia Gilman at the night at the 2019 BC game. I love that color combination. I do. Like those oh, are the nice. 88 uniforms. Uh, I think they look really good. I think they look really sharp. Let's show you guys that from the beginning. Um, they they were they had a little bit of mesh to them. I thought those were super sharp. I I, I really I really liked those. It's just me. so yeah <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I thought that was sharp. Uh, something like, so something like that's a bit of a throwback. You had like the mesh looking numbers, but it was a modern jersey. It wasn't like the old school mesh. Like you, you, you that just you can see through. Like you, I remember that's our practice jerseys when I was in college. Was that old school mesh stuff? I hated. Those yeah, things. I had those in high school too. Yeah, I had those in high yeah. school. Yeah. So, but yeah, I could see something like that. But definitely with the same color pants that they used to have for sure. That's the one absolutely that needs to change. So yeah, Mike, I'm I'm kind of with you on that a little bit, and that's a little bit kind of how I envision it, to be honest with you. Like, I don't want to get the real, really creepy. Like when Oregon has like certain color combination, like they ruin it with like these really weird wing things on their shoulder pads or their yeah. helmets, and it's just like, give me or, the green or, with the green helmet and the the yellow O. That's the one of the sweetest uniforms in college football. And they'll do like they'll have like two cool uniforms a year, and the rest are just hot garbage. In my opinion, yeah, they went they went a little too overboard on some of them because I mean, when the Oregon started doing the uniforms, they were like, "Oh man, that's sick, that's nice, mm -hmm. it's really cool." And then they just throw in like, "I hate their all gray uniforms." I saw them there a couple years ago. I'm just like, "That's ugly. That one's ugly. The the full lawn yellow is just like kind of and eh, like that's a little too much." Like they really they went really. You know what it is, Brian? Like they went very like, let's go color rush with everything we mm -hmm. do, right? Like everything has to match. I'm just like, no, just just stay with what you were doing. It was cool. And recruits loved it for a little bit there, man. They're like, oh, look at those uniforms. Incredible. And now it's just got kind of gimmicky, yeah. I think. People are just it's like just oh, lame at this point, at this point yeah. in time now. Yeah, it's yeah. lame now. It's definitely got lame now. All right, next question, Ryan. We have here from we had call me Ty and Ordinaire there, Joe. Here's one from Archer four five two, our resident Ohio State fan. Archer says, "My perspective: secondary has the chance to be elite. Linebackers have a lot of talent. Defensive line does not scare me. That's a combo of lack of big time playmaking and coaching." Well, I can understand why an Ohio State fan would not be uh, in love with the coaching because obviously that he Al Washington <laughs> he knows, leaves he knows how well. he with knows the how greatest well. reputation. Yeah, I, I think the talent is. I think the talent is better than people think uh, on the defensive is, but, line. But, yes, but to his point, there is no proven playmaker there. Proven There's playmaker. There's there could be playmaker step up. Maybe Tahoe. Oh, maybe Josh Burnham. Maybe Riley Mills. Maybe something like that. Maybe I don't know. But from a proven, if I'm an outsider looking in, I'm not concerned about their names. Uh, defensive line right now as an yeah. insider someone who knows the potential of that group i'm like ah, it could be pretty good but it's a it's a it's a big question mark because none of those guys have proven it on any sort with any sort of consistency whatsoever even but yeah. the whole last year he flashed hit some games here games there and then there's times where he was just terrible i mean go go watch the marshall game it was awful you know yeah. as were a lot of guys on the d line that game so the it's the consistency so can jordan patejo play like he did against south carolina consistently if so they got a playmaker on the D line, right? Yeah. Can Riley Mills play all the time like he has in flashes, like against Virginia and Wisconsin and uh, North Carolina? He was pretty good. There's been other games where when he's on, he's pretty good, but he's got to start being on every week, not just four or five games a year. I think those are the questions, Archer. So if I'm an outsider, I'm not worried about those guys because none of them have shown it to me consistently. But I would say that was the same concern heading into 2021 
because they had lost Adi, they had lost Dalen, they had lost Aguara, they had lost Tillery in the two to three previous years. All those guys that were really great on that 2018 team were gone. Well, then what happens? Isaiah Foskey steps up, goes from four and a half sacks to 11, yeah. right? And, and so now somebody needs to step up like he did. That's going to be the question, and I don't know who that's going to be. And until that happens, then, yeah, I'm not scared of the Notre Dame defensive line until that happens. And especially from Archer's perspective as an Ohio State fan, I mean, Notre Dame's defensive line did not – have a good day against Ohio State. No. I mean, you can't like, call it what it is, man. Isaiah Foskey had a great career at Notre Dame, a lot of accolades and everything. But I mean, he was invisible against DeWan Jones and that crew yet, that day. Like he just wasn't, he wasn't in the same atmosphere. Right. So yeah, there needs to be an influx. But, but I agree with you. I think there is a lot of talent on that defensive line. It's just, it has not been, it's not being you know. developed properly right now, which is and I, the main And I don't thing. know if there's any elite talent on it right now. I think down the road, so like yeah. I think jo- down the road Josh Burner could be elite. Do I expect him to be elite in 2023? No, I don't. I just expect to be hey, start showing those flashes, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, kind of like it's what a, you it's saw. A depth with- of talent for me. Yeah, yeah, is the potential. I, I was going to try to make a comparison between Ohio State. Like you need him to be like what Jack Sawyer was this year for Ohio State, right? Like it wasn't perfect all the time, but you saw it, right? Like you're like, oh, okay, there's a flash, there's a flash. It's just not consistent. It shouldn't be as a retro freshman. It shouldn't be consistent right. yet, right? Yep, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. So so good one on that one. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Let's get down to this next one from Tyler Smith. Tyler says, do you guys think the defense was more gassed because of the offensive play is why they de- did that di- where they died bad in certain games? That was supposed to say. Did. Why they, oh, they did bad. That's why they did games. bad. In oh, they, games. oh, they did poorly. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got yeah. It. Uh, yeah, I think there's there's something to that. Yeah, I think there's something to that. Not always. I think sometimes they were. Here's the thing, too. Here's the, here's the rub. Part of the reason that they were gassed at times is because they couldn't get off the field at times on third down. Right? Can't blame the offense for that. You know what I mean? Like, and, and it's like, you know, look, they had their, their mistakes, too. Offense played terrible against Stanford. But then the offense finally put something together and gets a touchdown to give them a lead in the fourth quarter. And they give it right back and they go right down the field and score. So, I mean, that's, that's partly your fault too, is you've, you've got to do better on third down. I mean, you could say, Oh, the offense didn't do really well uh, against Marshall and they didn't. The offense went four of 13 on third down. You know who else went four of 13 on third down Marshall, right? That's what kept the game close, but game on the line late in the game, you couldn't get off the field. Right. I mean, you know, part of the reason Ohio State defense couldn't get off the field in the second half. Why? Because Ohio State kept moving the chains. They went seven of thirteen on fourth down, on third down. You know, why offense wasn't on the field long enough against you? You gave up eight of twelve third down attempts against USC. That's why you lost, I- including the two turnovers. Like, it wasn't that you were gassed? You didn't make plays. Yeah, chan- first drive of the game, they got third and short, and they just turned the tight end loose for a big play. You're ready to get off the field right there. Bam, off the field. You give up a play. It's not on the offense. So at times, yeah. Tyler, Tyler, absolutely at times, they, that is true. And this offense this year has to be more efficient in, in, in those areas. But at the same time, you can help yourself get off the stay off the field by making stops. The other thing that hurt him is they were a decent third down defense last year, but forced no turnovers for the first half of the season. You know, and so so again, get yourself off the field. That's the key. If you can do that, then you won't be on the field as long. I mean, it, it's it's kind of there, common sense. There were so many head shakers last year, Brian. Like, how many like third and longs did a team like? Oh yeah, convert? like if you were, were in third like... and four against Notre Dame, you were screwed. Where you wanted to be is like you almost like, hey, if you're in third and four, take a couple delays. Seriously, because Notre Seriously. Dame cannot stop anyone in third and ten plus. I mean, it just Ugh. including on running plays, and it was like simple stuff, like the third nine against Marshall. It's like a, a a back running an under route from the opposite side. Like that's should be one of the easiest things to defend. You know, you got third and 18. They run a draw against BYU, and nobody gets to the guy until he gets to the first down marker. It's just like, just stuff like that was maddening. That's not on the yeah. offense. That's on you. You make those stops, and then your offense is putting people away. Yeah. That's the reality of it, right? So get off the field. You got gassed against Ohio State because you couldn't stop their run game in the second half. It's not on the offense. It's on you. Now, the offense played like crap in that game for sure, but you've got to start making those stops as well. And then the offense has to step up big time. I mean, the offense needs to make a lot more improvement this year than the defense does. Let's let's be honest about that. Yep. But it, it needs to get better. We have another one from Gavin Harden. Says, Ryan, could you see Darnell Washington making a transition to tackle in the NFL, kind of like a Taylor Decker? I mean, could he? 
Gavin? I mean, could he? Sure. I mean, he's 6'7", 270 plus pounds, who has an easy frame where he could be 300 pounds if he wanted to. I don't think that that transition is going to happen because I do think that, I mean, th- this is my pushback with the Darnell Washington stuff. I think Darnell Washington is very overrated for the simple fact that great blocker, big frame. I question what the upside is as a receiver. Is he ever going to be a high volume receiver? I just, I don't know if that's the case at the next level. I think he's more of a Bubba Franks style tight end, which there's nothing wrong with that. Bubba Franks was a good football player for several years in the NFL. I think he had like eight or nine touchdowns one year for the Green Bay Packers. Good football player. But I don't think that, I don't think that you've seen the best though of Darnell Washington either. I do think that he's a developing prospect. I mean, they're, they're, like, let's be honest from a passing game perspective, if Eric Gilbert wasn't such a knucklehead, he Darnell Washington's probably back in school again this year because he doesn't have any volume perspective at all. So could could he if he wanted to? Sure. But I think that honestly, Darnell Washington is going to be a very good member of a tight end room at the next level. High effort as a blocker, very strong displacement power. You're just going to have to be an understanding that maybe Darnell Washington's not going to be a 50 plus catch a game guy. Maybe it's not what that is, right? He's probably more a 30 to 40 catch guy who can win some in the red zone and could be a dominant for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just think you have to have a general understanding of what Darnell Washington is. Don't try to make him something he's not. He's one of those guys I feel bad for Ryan, because he's one of those guys that if he'd have played in a different era, he'd have been a star. If Manti Teo would have played in the NFL in the eighties or nineties, he's a hall of famer. If he's healthy, I'm being a bit hyperbolic. He'd have been a great NFL player in my opinion assuming good health, because that's another part of what hurt Manti too, is he, he got hurt pretty early in his career and just couldn't stay healthy. Yep. But the game was starting to evolve away from what he does. And even if he was healthy, he's still a two down linebacker in the NFL against some, and some teams you just like, you know, can't really use them. It, D- Darnell Washington 30 years ago is a star tight end. Yeah. Back in the day of where you wanted a guy like him playing tight end and attached block nine techniques run play action passes and stuff like that, right? Like he has that old school tight end. And so you're like, man, if he would have come along 30 years ago, that guy's going to be a first round draft pick. I mean, he, he might still no be doubt. a first round draft pick. Yeah. He might still be because people are going to fall. But in someone's love not going to say it with that disdain in their face. Like you just, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's like, you know, wow. Yeah. Of course you want to get that guy. So that's it. That's the other part of it too, is just wh- what offenses does he fit? That's yeah. That's my question. I, I just hate the overhyping of prospects sometimes because, like, I'm just like, I want to enjoy Darnell Washington as a prospect, man. He's one of the best blocking tight ends to come out in several years. He's a massive kid. He's got strong hands. A lot of good that you can come out of him. Is he a first round player? In my opinion, no, he's not. Not today. Not not in this game now. But it doesn't mean that he's not a good football player, though. Darnell Washington's a heck of a football player. Yeah. If I could have Darnell Washington on Notre Dame's roster right now, you don't think I would take him? Heck yeah, I would take Absolutely. him. There's no doubt about it. Absolutely. <laughs> we have a couple questions about Darius Walker. One is from Tyler Smith. He says, how come Darius Walker doesn't get talked about much when it comes to Notre Dame past running backs? And then the second one is from Anthony Manzano. Who is your favorite Notre Dame running back uh, of all time? Mine is Darius Walker. So let's begin with this one from uh, Tyler Smith, Ryan. Why doesn't, how come Darius Walker doesn't get talked about when it comes to the past Notre Dame running backs? Do you have a thought on that? I, do. I mean, I think, I think it's because he played with a lot of stars. I mean, you're talking about the Samarges, the Stovalls, the Brady Quins. I mean, Darius Walker was a good football player though. There's no doubt about it. It's just, I mean, when you play with so many, it's like, it's like when in the past, like Jerry Kramer's a guy for the Green Bay Packers in like the sixties and seventies. He's not in the hall of fame, mostly because he played with so many other players that made the Hall of Fame that he gets overlooked. That's kind of what happens there. And I think that's what happens with Darius Walker. He's a good football player. that gets overshadowed a little bit because he played with a lot of good other offensive players, man. Like, that's just where it comes down to for me. Jerry Walker or Jerry Kramer actually was inducted in the Hall of Fame. It just was very, very late. He was very late, but he is currently in the uh, in the uh, Hall of Fame. When did he go in? It must have been, like, super recently. Yeah, 2018. Oh, okay, Michigan. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yep. 2018. So it was it was very late. Yeah. It's it's that's part of it, Ryan. He was very overshadowed by other stars. I mean, that's just and you had a, a head coach who took up a lot of oxygen as well. You know, mm-hmm. uh, like you said, Brady, Samarja, Stovall, uh, Rayma, you know, Abby Amiri, the tight ends were really good. Anthony I think Sano, the other yeah. part of it too is he wasn't real sexy as a player. He just was <laughs> a 
just do your job. I mean, he averaged two, 4.7 yards per carry in 2005. He averaged 5.0 in 2000, uh, in 2006. Caught a lot of passes. Caught over 100 passes in only three years. I think to a degree there's also some Notre Dame fans that are a little upset with Darius for two things. One, he didn't come back in 07, which I don't blame him because I think he knew what was going to happen to whoever played running back <laughs> that next year. True. Like that, that writing was on the wall. But number two, him running out of bounds against USC on that last drive. I know a lot of front people who will never, from a football standpoint, will never forgive him for that because does USC have enough time to make that drive at the end if he doesn't run out of bounds? That's very fair. I get that. Very yeah. fair. Yeah. So I think that's part, but I think the first two reasons are more why overshadowed by other all time greats. And then he just wasn't a sexy player, but he was very, he was very important to that offense. Very important. He just isn't the sexy kind of guy that's going to have that, you know, but look, the thing about him, he played well in both bowl games. He played well against Ohio state and he played very well. I mean, he's their only good offensive player against LSU the next year, rushed for over hundred yards in that game. So he, uh, yeah, you know, and he was slow. I think some people are going to evaluate him. Oh, he's slow. He wasn't. You know, he was a very good back. He had great vision, great feet. Really good this back. Was, this was slow. Yeah. He's a very good running. Very underrated running. Could catch. Could block. I mean, he he was a very good running back. I, yeah. I was surprised that he didn't stick in the NFL for a couple of years because I thought the catching speed. and the block, blocking ability would Just be the, kind of the a speed. He was really slow, like really slow. He's a good back. Yeah, I met him once. He's a re- pretty nice guy. Very personable. Very energetic. But yeah, Ryan, I, I, I think his game too would would be even better suited today's NFL. I think in today's yeah. NFL he'd be he'd even have a better chance. But he I mean, he was just really slow. I think that was the issue. And then this one from Anthony Mazzano, Ryan, is uh, who is your favorite Notre Dame running back of all time? All time, all time's tough. I mean, yeah. I have a group. I mean, it's Julius Jones for obvious reasons. Great player from that's Virginia. It's a good one. Yeah, Reggie Brooks is in that conversation. Jerome Bettis. I mean, those are. Those are some of my, I mean, those are, those are, and usually your favorite player is usually going to be someone from your childhood. So those, I mean, those I, are I, 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 I really loved Kyron, man. Kyron was a fun yeah. player to watch. I know that's more recent, but like he really brought the joy to the game. You know who I loved, Brian, that unfortunately his career did not end the way you once thought it might, but I love Terry and Folson early oh, in his yeah. career, man. I really love Before the Folsom. knee injury. Yeah. yeah really like good. his, his freshman year, man. I was like, that dude's going to be legit. Yeah. And then the injury yeah. ensued. Ricky Waters is another one, but he really only played true running back for like one year. Yeah. Um, and well, two 89 and 90, but more so 90. But yeah. They, they used to have some really good running backs, man. Darius Walker would probably be high on my board too. I really yeah. did like Darius Walker. I yeah. really did. Yeah, you were a little too young to, to remember the Bettis and Brooks, Ricky Waters yeah. year. I mean, I, I, I remember. They were, yeah, they yeah. Were, you were one when they left or two years old when they left Notre Dame. So, yeah, I get that. I, I mean, I, rem- I remember Ricky running Waters and Jerome, the bus Bettis when they were in the NFL, like for sure. sure but sure. yeah, not right. as much in Notre Dame uniform. Right. We have a super chat here from Beef Eater. Here we go, Ryan. B Feeder says, B Ryan, thoughts on removing the play like champion sign until we win a natty to motivate the team, being a champion greater than playing like a champion. No. No, I, I would I, I get where you're coming from, but to me, it's it's play like a champion is something that establishes your what your mindset needs to be every day. Right? Yeah. Like every day, play like a champion, play like a champion, practice like a champion, you know, prepare like a champion, do all of it. Uh, to me, I I'm I, I understand where you're coming from. But that's like the kind of silliness that Brian Kelly did. What you're saying isn't silly. I understand where you're coming from. What Brian Kelly was silly. We're not going to have the number one jersey be used until we're back to being number one all-time win percent. Like, well, that's stupid. You know what I mean? Like, that's just dumb. But to me, the reason it's important, and I think there's merit to your suggestion. I'm not dismissing it. Like, for me, I want that around my program because I want those guys. I would actually make it more visible. So, like, you, and maybe it is. But like I, they need to see it walking out of the practice field, walking into the practice field, walking up, because like guys, this is your mindset. It has to be yeah. every day. You got to practice on a Monday, you don't, or Tuesday, you don't want to be there. Sunday night practice, you don't want to be there. That grind in the middle of fall camp where you're just like, dude, I don't want to do anything but sleep for the next three days. I get it, but that mindset needs to be beat into your head. That's the expectation of you today. If you want to win a championship in January, you got to practice like one in August. Yeah. And I think that's the mindset you need to have. And and I think removing those doesn't help in that regard. I just I you know, I don't I don't I don't think it does. But 
I think at this point in time, I understand the sympathy, Ryan, of wanting to just think of something to motivate these guys to do that. I just don't think that is the direction that I would go. Notre Dame's such a built-on tradition program, you know? Like, I don't want to take the greatest parts of it away just to, you know, because I, I get I get it too, to be fair. Trust me. I want to see a championship so bad. <laughs> I really do, yeah. man. Like, there's no doubt about it. you've never it, seen one. I've never you, seen you, one. You, yeah. Never seen one. But at the end of the day, the reasons – part of the reasons I love Notre Dame is – the tradition of it, right. you know, what it stands for. And that the play like a champion sign is part of it. You know, I, when I got a tattoo, I got the play like a champion sign on me. Like I, that's just, it's synonymous with Notre Dame. It matters to me. So that tradition matters. Yeah. Next question here. And I think we're going to wrap up here with this one from Ray Holcroft. Actually, we have two uh, real quick from uh, Mr. 2.0. I'll just read this one real quick. Ryan, anything on Aiden sure. Anna? People are talking like he might transfer after the season, but I think he'll ideally be a big role this year, need size on the D-line. He's not leaving right now. He's going to be there for the spring. For some reason, I just don't think Al Washington likes Aiden Kanaana very much, and I think that's silly. Uh, if they're smart, they will allow him to fight for playing time this year. Absolutely. If Look, you're running a defense that doesn't allow your defensive lineman to penetrate as much inside, so why wouldn't you want the biggest guy on your roster to be into it? <laughs> Seriously. In a Seriously, just, some of the stuff they say and do just uh, the D line, just like I just want to pound my head on the table, just like what the is going on. But that's really the reason. And if and if he still doesn't get coached and pushed this spring, then yeah, I, I could see him leaving. But I think right now the focus is on letting him go out there and say, okay, you don't want to, you don't want to give me a shot. I'm going to earn it and yeah. show you because I think Aiden wants to be at Notre Dame. Otherwise, he'd have left. So, uh, and he's a good kid and he's close to getting his degree. So yeah, I hope he has a breakout spring for sure. And I saw him in I saw him in the weight room the other day too, and he looks like he's working, man. Like he looked yeah. good. Oh, that, looked that's good never healthy. a question. He's got to stay healthy, but working's never going to be a question for for Aiden. Yeah. And then here's the last one from Ray Holcroft. Question is: Which position group from the 2023 recruiting cycle is needed most for the 2023 season? Ideally, which players need to play as freshmen? I I think wide receivers for me is one that we've talked about a ton. I mean. Look, the cornerback class is great. You don't need the corners a ton. You don't need them this year. I mean, would it be nice if Christian Gray steps up and is that third corner, fourth corner, whatever he ends up being? I mean, sure. But I think for me, it is the wide receivers. You need to continue to win talent into that room. You have a couple guys that I think, you know, the Jaden Greathouses of the world, the Rico Flores of the world, the guys that could instantly impact this team. And, uh, you know, you're still fighting depth issues from the previous staff. You're still trying to, you know, get back to the numbers you need. And I think a couple of those kids need to step up and play a lot early, potentially, at least give you some rotation. Yeah, I, I think linebacker depth is going to – you're going to need some at the linebacker special teams depth this year. I, I think tight end is a good one. I could definitely see that. And I think I think one defense – one interior defensive lineman needs to step up. I mean, whether it's Devin Houston or Brendan Vernon, I think there's another area where they could help. And the safeties, as you mentioned, Ryan, I think there's definitely going to need at least one safety yep. to work into the rotation this year, ideally, uh, would certainly be where they are. We, have, we do have a super chat, Ryan, that we're going to end with. So we had one sure. from Charlie Weiss's last belt loop. How did Coach Weiss get Jimmy, Floyd, and Tate? That's Golden Tate, Michael Floyd, Jimmy uh, Jimmy Clausen. I mean, this guy could recruit. I don't think Notre Dame has gotten those types of talent since he left. I think a Freeman, D.C., Charlie, O.C. team would be scary. Thank you, I.B. Uh, thank you for the Super Chat, Charlie. The biggest reason is he was selling Tom Brady and the offense that he had, and then he had the two years under, under Brady Quinn, with Brady Quinn. So – he had something to sell. And, you know, the, Michael Floyd's looking at Notre Dame and and you've got Zeph Samarja was in the, the I think he was a Bolitnikoff finalist, I believe, in, in one of those years. You've got Stovall's a thousand yard receiver. Second round the football. Pick. Yeah, 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 exactly. And and you've got Brady throwing it all over the yard. He wins the Maxwell Award, I believe. What didn't uh, I think? I thought Brady won the Maxwell Award. He won I'm, one of those. Like might have been. Davey I'm almost O'Brien. positive. Almost positive. Yeah, it might have been the Davy O'Brien. Let me look and see what Brady Brady. He won one of those big awards. Yeah, Maxwell Award and the Golden Unitas Arm Award and the Sammy Ball Trophy. Uh, so uh, you know you had a guy that was was where he was and. And it was a very attractive. And Charlie was selling, I can get you the NFL. Plus, Notre Dame is still Notre Dame. And Colton Tate went to a, a Catholic school in Tennessee. Pope, same as Kenny Minchie, Pope John Paul II. Michael Floyd was from Minnesota. You know, So you had those unique situations. And, of course, Jimmy was going to play for a guy that was going to get in the NFL. And at the time, USC was kind of starting to come down a little bit. They were, 
there was a lot of rum. It was before the sanctions. I believe it was before the sanctions started to hit, but there was rumblings about things that were coming along. And, you know, and I think at the time he wanted to, you know, Notre Dame made a lot of sense for him because you got to remember when, when, when Jimmy committed to Notre Dame, they were hot. They were coming off the Fiesta Bowl. I mean, they were the hot team. And same thing with Golden Tate. Like, Michael Floyd's the one that committed to them when they were bad. Like, he committed them during the 07 season. But Golden Tate and Jimmy were were committed to Notre Dame after the back-to-back 10, you know, well, the 9-win and the 10-win season, but the back-to-back really the BCS years that Notre Dame had. Going to the Fiesta one year and the Sugar the next year. So it made total sense why they came to Notre Dame. It's the guys that came later. Now, I would somewhat disagree that they haven't got guys like they like that since. I mean, they got Manti in 09. Manti was every bit as of a big of a recruit as those guys. Uh, they got Aaron Lynch, was a big-time recruit, Stephon Tuitt. Now, they haven't gotten a lot of those guys. That's a very fair point, Charlie. Uh, but, I mean, but he sold it. But, again, what was it that sold it, Ryan? It wasn't Notre Dame's prestige. It wasn't the history. It was you're putting points up on the board, and your offense is throwing yes. it all over the yard. It's yes. proven results. Proven results will get why, – why does Notre Dame recruit big-time offensive linemen consistently? Because they look at it and say, well, if you want to get to be a first-round NFL draft pick, be an All-American and all that, guess where you need to go? Notre Dame. Right. And same with tight ends. Why do they have success recruiting big-time guys there but not wide receiver? Well, if you're a wide receiver right now, why would you want to play in the Notre Dame offense? That's the thing. That's what made the job Chancey did so so good. Because he put that receiver class together in the midst of them being a – saying they were a mediocre pass team last year is being nice. Yes. Especially when you look at the receiver. I mean, most of their big plays in the pass game came from their tight end and their running backs. And so, I mean, I would argue that Audric Estime had more big, important plays in the pass game than, than Lorenzo Styles did last year. So, uh, Easily, you know, I, th- I would say, yeah, actually. He had, yeah. he had, what, the one touchdown against – North Carolina up a yep. seam, it, you yep. know, but, but Audrick had a, had several like big, important plays in the pass game. I'm not putting that all on Lorenzo styles. I'm making a point. That's how bad the pass game was last year. Yes. And, and yet he still wouldn't got that group. So look, if the results start to come, the players will come. I, I've said this for years, you know, if you build a championship team or, or, or a really fun, exciting team or something that is attractive to people, they will want to be part of it. And it's just simple as that. So, um, but that's how he, and he was a very good recruiter. I mean, look, he would literally have kids come to office and he'd have all four Super Bowl rings on his fingers. That matters. It's an easy sell. It's an easy sell. Hey, yeah. I, I coached Tom Brady to four Super Bowl, so Super Bowls. That sells. Yes. You know, so uh, yeah, that, that, that was part of it too, right? Was yep. absolutely that. So, Ryan, that is going to do it for today's show, Uh, and you're welcome, Charlie. Appreciate that very much. That's going to do it for today's show. Um, uh, Caleb Collins had a question about Anthony Richardson. Caleb, that's a great question for the message board because I'm sure Ryan has a lot of thoughts on that, but we're we're going to get out of here. He was asking about why is Caleb Richard, Anthony Richardson being projected to the number one pick. Uh, I'm sure Ryan has a lot to say about that, but that is for the message boards, which you can find at boards at ourspreakdown.com folks. Before you get out of here, please do us a favor, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share this podcast Time for the message boards. If you haven't already done so, they are still raising money for Jaden Mickey's mom. And so we have, you can find that on my Twitter page. You can go to Jaden's Twitter page. Uh, they are still definitely in need of more money. Uh, to help her she actually put something up the other day of just her talking and showing just because like we haven't seen it we haven't seen a picture of her in a while just kind of showing how how the cancer is kind of what the damage is doing to her so uh, if you're still able please we would we would ask you to do that but also if you're if if you are able to spend but if you're not able to give money uh, the power of prayer is still something that i very much believe in so uh, you can always do that as well so anyway folks have a great rest of your day I'm not sure if we're going to be back or not tomorrow. We will have the 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 um, the uh, rapid fire special rapid fire coming up here tonight with Sean Styers and the crew. Uh, follow me on Twitter and on the message board at, at Coach D178 on Twitter, and I'll let you know if we're going to be doing the show tomorrow or not. I got to talk to Sean Davis. I got to talk to my wife because I, I know there's some things she had going on tomorrow, uh, and we'll let you know if we're going to have the Saturday show tomorrow. But if not, we'll be back on Monday. If we are, I will see you tomorrow. But either way, make sure you stick around and hang in to the Irish Breakdown Podcast.